Okay, welcome to the September 13, 2011 joint meeting of the Glendale City Council and the GWP Commission. Can we have a roll call for the City Council, please? Council members Manukian? Here. Najarian? Here. Quintero? Here. Weaver? Here. Mayor Friedman? Here. Mr. President Chen, if you may. Can we have a roll call for the Glendale Water Park Commission, please? Commissioner Zajemian? Here. Armenian? Present. Dentler? Here. Yao? Present. President Chen? Present. And can we hear your report, please? Certainly. The agenda for a September 13, 2011 joint public meeting of the City Council and Glendale Water and Power Commission was posted on Thursday, September 8, 2011, on the bulletin board outside City Hall. Before you today is General Manager of Glendale Water and Power regarding water rate structure. Steiger. Good afternoon, Mayor Friedman, members of the Glendale City Council, President Chan, members of the GWP Commission. Thank you very much for participating in our workshop today. Today, myself, along with Peter Cavonis, Assistant General Manager of Water Services for Glendale Water and Power, and Habib Isaac and Pierce Rossum from Will Dan Financial Services will present a long-term financial overview and rate redesign uh, for GWP. This will be a long-term financial plan, uh, originally presented to both City Council and Commission in 2007. This is a continuation of that same plan, uh, updated to today's conditions and with rate restructuring per direction from City Council, a more recent direction. Since 2007, many things have changed, some good, some bad, and that's reflected in what you'll see today. Glendale's not alone in this situation. Most water utilities in Southern California face the same challenges that we do, both from a financial and operational standpoint. Today's presentation pre presents a well-designed and financially sound roadmap for GWP as we move forward. We're going to talk about four areas today. The rate redesign as directed uh, by City Council in late 2010, a five-year financial plan along with the historical perspective leading up to that, revenue increase alternatives, and then finally recommendations. And what I'd like to do at this point is give our recommendations right up front, and then we'll go through all the detail and all the history leading up to why we're making these recommendations. We are recommending a significant rate redesign to capture those elements that are critical to our customers, including incentive for water conservation without penalty for reduced water usage. We're looking at a multi-year multi revenue increase, as shown, with 5% increases in years 1, 2, and 3, and a 4% increase in year 4. A $60 million bond issue in early 2012. These combined, uh, the combined rate in increases along with the bonding will allow us to achieve a pay-as-you-go status uh, from here on in year 5, so therefore uh, precluding the need for bonding in the future. What, what does that mean, pay-as-you-go? It, it means that we'll no longer need bonding uh, for capital projects, that we'll get to a point where... Oh, okay, we'll for the able... capital projects, not for the tax grants. Th that's for capital projects, and yeah, correct. And ultimately, uh, we can transition to monthly bill. We now have a bi-monthly billing, and we are proposing to go to a monthly bill. Uh, rate redesign, you mean rate increase, right? Uh, no. Uh, That's what we're talking about There's here. actually two pieces, and uh, Will Dan will go through that with you, but the rate redesign is actually how we, uh, how we tier the rates so that uh, certain parts of our, our customer base are incented to use uh, less and other parts are disincented to use more, essentially. And that's basically how most utilities are looking at rate design today. And in fact, when we talked last year, uh, as we came out of our uh, mandatory wa water restrictions, uh, that would seem to be the direction that we were discussing last year in terms of bringing GWP's water rates to. At this point, I'd like to introduce Peter Cavonis, Assistant General Manager of Water Services, who will take you through these recommendations. 
Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, members of, the, members of the City Council, Madam Chair, and members of the Commission. I'm Peter Cavunas, Assistant General Manager for Water for GWP. As we're preparing for this presentation, we realize that some of you may not have been on Council and Commission in 2007 and may not be as familiar with the water system. So we thought a, a good place to start would be uh, by uh, giving you an overview of the uh, water system itself and the facilities that we use and the facilities that we manage, maintain, and operate to deliver water to our residents every day. Uh, how does the clicker operate? Are these slides included in the PowerPoint presentation that you sent me on Friday? No, I don't think so. Are, are these slides included in the PowerPoint presentation that you sent me on Friday? These slides are included in the attachment that you have in your handout today. They are uh, extracted from the 2007 presentation. The entire 2007 presentation is attached uh, because what we'll show you today is just a very small, it's only about 15 slides of those, and they are simply describing the system. They're not describing anything new. Uh, so in 2007, we had given a presentation describing the system a little bit. This is the outline familiar to you, the, sh the shape and the, uh, the city of Glendale. And in different colors are shown different pressure zones, getting higher in elevation as we move higher up on the mountains. Our facilities are spread throughout the city. And as you probably all know, we have connections with the Metropolitan Water District where we purchase additional water that we cannot supply from our groundwater wells. We have uh, shown here are 13... What kind of facilities were the initial three that you... These are connections with Metropolitan Water District okay. Pipe. All right. uh, shown here are groundwater wells. We have 14 wells shown, and since the map was created in 2007, we have successfully uh, rehabilitated another well, so we have one more well serving the city with groundwater. And we have two water treatment plants, one that treats polluted groundwater and another that treats uh, groundwater that's considered to be under the influence of surface water. Is that, is that new well that we uh, did at Rock Haven included in this? No, the Rock Haven well has not been shown on this map yet. I just we want to ask everyone up on the dais, if you have a question that you really need answered right away, to go ahead and ask it. Okay. But otherwise, let's write questions down and ask them. They're going to be giving us points throughout the presentation where we can ask questions. That way we, we can kind of keep the, the flow going here. Thank you, Madam. Well, I'm, I'm trying. I'm just trying yeah. to well, get like short, said, short things regarding stuff like that. If you so. need it to continue to really understand okay. it, that's fine. Okay. We have approximately 380 miles of water mains throughout the city. What's shown here are, are the larger mains. We have over 30 pump stations throughout the city. We have over 30 storage facilities throughout the city. And we have 35 to 40 water quality sampling monitoring stations throughout the city. That's a brief overview. And if you were to look at our system in a schematic view, rising in elevation, you would see that uh, these are laid out in schematic view. The higher up the page you go, the higher in elevation you are. And you can see that each pressure zone is served by a number of reservoirs and pump stations, making up a fairly complex system, uh, especially in light of how small the city of Glendale is. In addition to potable, we have recycled water supply system, a little bit simpler, uh, with uh, six storage facilities and pump stations. This chart was also presented uh, to Council and Commission in 2007, and it's a history of when water mains were installed in Glendale. Starting in the early times, 1920, uh, there's a big spike that shown there because the records weren't that good, particularly before 1920. But you can see about half of the pipe that was installed in Glendale, and still is in Glendale, was installed before uh, 1940. Uh, I believe it was September of 2007. Okay. We showed some facilities that were in disrepair. We have many facilities that are in very good condition. We like showed some examples <laughs> of uh, facilities that are not in good condition and necessitate the need for repair, refurbishment, or replacement. The intent of showing these, uh, the complete listing is shown in the 2007 presentation. The intent is not to scare you that we have a decrepit system that's falling apart, but to show you that we do have legitimate needs in the system. This was shown, uh, this uh, pump was shown in this uh, particular pump station. Uh, as you can imagine, having uh, problems with infrastructure can result to other collateral problems for the city. 
And one of the main issues we have to deal with is old pipes that tuberculate, uh, and it happens in the pipes that don't have lining. Those, li those pipes are pipes that were primarily installed before 1940. After 1940, we switched from cast iron unlined pipe uh, to ductile iron lined. Unfortunately, that also goes with about half the pipes that are in the system have the potential of being, um, being obstructed. This, of course, has created several problems. In 2007, we presented a 20-year CIP that was fairly ambitious. Is, these are the projects we thought we would have to do over the next 20 years to improve the system. At that time, we had retained CDM, a consultant that did a study for us. They reviewed the existing rate structure at the time, and at that time, we didn't change it from the two-tier rate structure that we had. It's still the same rate structure. They looked at the revenue we generate and the funding that would be required to fund the capital improvement program along with operations and maintenance. They ended up recommending rate increases and debt issuance at that time. And at that time, they recommended looking out long term, although what Council acted on was the first three years. And Council approved base rate increases of 9%, 14%, and 12% those first three years. CDM also recommended issuing $50 million in debt, which we did in 2008. So a total of approximately 35 percent in three years, right? Which is a little bit more, actually. In addition to that, CDM created a chart that showed the city's reserve target. Of, uh, that's the adopted city reserve policy of $11.3 million and what the cash balance would be if we were to follow those recommended rate increases, certainly the first three years, and then if we were to follow them for the years out. The point of reserves is to help in case of emergencies, including unplanned capital projects, rate relief in case of drought or shortage, and paying for operations and maintenance in case revenue disappears, in case of earthquakes or other disasters. So that's kind of a brief step back in history as to where we were. And George, if we can go back to the main presentation. Excuse me. I'm wondering where where is this? You said it was in an attachment to what we received, but I, if you look at section two of the uh, handout that you have, section two is a 135 slide presentation that we gave to a thank you very tolerant city two. council thank and you. very tolerant commission in 2007. You're sparing us today with only 75. Today is only 75. Yes. So. After Council's direction, in November 2010, the Council approved a net 3.8 percent rate increase and gave us direction to go ahead and implement a new rate structure. That, that was one of the drivers why we're here today. It's actually very interesting. There's a survey by RKS, a consulting firm, that is just being finalized now that indicates two-thirds of Californians favor charging, charging customers so that the more water they use, the higher price they pay per unit of water that they use, so an increasing tier structure. So you'll see that in the presentation that uh, will be made shortly by the Wildan folks. Af after receiving Council's direction, we issued a competitive RFP, and we selected Wildan. We have been back to the Commission. Can you explain what do you mean by adjustable rate decrease? I'm not familiar with that. The existing rate structure has a base rate and it has an adjustable rate. The adjustable rate is also called a pass-through, that is there to capture the cost of purchased water, energy, and uh, cleanup of contamination in the San Fernando Basin. That adjusts up to six um, on January and June of each year. And at that time, we were over-collected, so we decreased that by 11.2 percent at that time. So the net impact to the customers was only 3.8. It's determined twice a year? Yes. Is that what you said? And it was over-collected, you said? It was over-collected at that time. Do you know by how much? Uh, not off the top of my head. Will Dan has been giving, uh, either Will Dan or our staff have briefed the Commission on the progress of the rate redesign study and, the, and have developed a rate model that provides flexibility for options, options to study that we can bring to you. <laughs> You will see live model scenarios if you want. Uh, we, can, we have the ability to run the model live on screen. And the, one of the beauties of the model is that it can present the impact to the utilities financial picture, and it can also give you an idea of what the impact to the customer is in a very easy-to-understand graphical interface format. 
The scenarios that we've asked Will Dan to run are long-term. We've asked him to look at 10 years out because running a utility is a long-term proposition. They all do show, and you'll see that in the discussion, the need for a continuing revenue increase over time. The, the question is how much, and our hope is that uh, you'll find it uh, fairly reasonable. So with that, I'd like to introduce the, uh, let's see, Habib, I think are you first? Good afternoon, Mayor, Mayor Freeman, President Chan, Council Members, and GOP Commissions. My name is Habib Isaac with Wildan Financial, and alongside me is Pierce Rossum. Uh, I'm the project manager, and Pierce is a task manager, respectively, for this project. Uh, before I get into it, one thing I want to inform you in regards to our presentation is we first want to identify the approach that we take with, with the rate study when we update it or when we establish a new one. And then based on that, what are the specific objecti objectives of the agency that we're working with? How do, how do we get to that point? What are going to be the proposed changes? And then what are some of the analyses that back up those recommendations? So with that, uh, with this slide, what you see here is our typical approach when we do rate design. The first thing we want to do is identify the revenue requirements of the, of the enterprise fund for water. And what that is composed of is operation maintenance, debt, uh, capital improvements, infrastructure improvements, as well as any type of reserves to be built out. So that's basically ensuring that the utility is financially healthy. From there, then we take that total cost, and then we need to determine what's the proper way to allocate those costs to the different customer classes that are established for the GWP. And that is based on cost of service principles uh, in compliance with Proposition 218. And then from that point, we then go to the rate design. One is one, the cost of service is what amount should be allocated based on the demand placed by different customers. The rate design is what's the best means to collect that revenue from the accounts within each customer class. What's the most equitable way to collect it? However, we don't just stop there. We also look at, based on the rate design, depending on the structure that we, we develop and the objectives that are, that are planned to be met, uh, we have to take a look, can you go one, one back? We have to take a look at to what are the effects of rate design? Um, is there gonna be a reduction in, in consumption due to maybe the what the cost is on a monthly basis. That's going to then reduce your cost of, say, the purchase amount of water you get from MET. So we also go back and see how does that affect your cost of service as well as revenue requirements. So somewhat of an iterative process. Also, I want to first identify where you are today before I show you what are the proposed changes. Today, as Peter alluded to, is you do have a fixed charge, and that's based on the meter sizes. The bigger the meter, the more it costs to uh, do uh, maintenance on that as well as replacement. And then you have a two-tiered system, which is based on the amount of water that you use. And within that structure, there are 15 different billing classifications today for GWP. The, one of the main reasons of the 15 different classifications is also because you're an electric utility as well, that some of those classifications not only relate to water, but also relate to characteristics of electric use. Uh, so with that, we're also gonna make modifications to, to um, groupings related to specific to water. Now, in regards to the objective- I'm, I'm sorry, what does, what does, I have to step off for a minute. Sure. What are those? What this does that refer to, one inch? Is that what it, what's it referred to? This is the fixed charge. So there's a fixed charge to every single customer today. This is your existing rate structure that is based on the size of the meters. And this is very common practice. The bigger size the meter, okay. the more maintenance. All right. So it refers to the meters, those dimensions. Yes, that's correct. And they get charged that every month or bi-monthly. Uh, another component is what are the rate design objectives? Uh, First of all, as I mentioned earlier, we always want to make sure that we're in compliance with Prop 218, which is the cost of service, to ensure that there is a nexus between what is the cost associated with the different customer classes and how are those costs were developed. We also want to make sure in regards to objectives of the GWP is that any type of restructuring that we do, we don't want to shock the system significantly. So that's why we're looking at a planning horizon of five to 10 years. So there'll be a smooth transition and ensure affordability to pay. 
Uh, we also are accounting for unknowns, such as increase in met costs, as well as if uh, people continue their behavior of conserving uh, and, and using water efficiently. So we're taking that into account in regards to what um, reductions in water use might occur in future years. And then also, you are a signatory to the California Urban, uh, California Urban Water Conservation Council. And that council is basically an association of agencies of what are the best management practices uh, for e efficient water use. Now, with the proposed changes, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you do have 15 different billing categories. We want to transition that and group it to reflect more appropriate classifications that are very specific to water use and water needs. Uh, those, those classifications are comprised of four distinct customer classes, which include single family, multifamily, and those will, will be uh, designed on a tiered system. You are in tiered system today. And then with non-residential, we have commercial, which we propose a uniform rate, as well as irrigation, which would be a uniform rate. Now the question is, well, how do, how do we get there? How do we establish these customer classes? The means by which we got there is by analyzing consumption data of all your accounts. And we look at a span of over uh, five years, roughly around six years of data. That comprised over 1.2 million records. And what that allows us to do is look at the trend of usage of, of uh, different customer classes, what makes the most sense in consolidating groups, as well as what is the trend uh, of that use and their particular uh, demand and peaking factors that affects the utility and the infrastructure. Uh, this is a makeup of your water sources. When we talk about cost of service and allocating costs based on on service demands, one of those components is to identify where do you get your water. And you do have groundwater production. And then uh, in the red is actually the water that you purchase from Metropolitan Water District. As you can see, you, you increase your purchase amount pretty much in line with when it's a high season, the summer months, uh, typically right around August of when it peaks. And we take this into account to determine uh, the cost associated with water, uh, groundwater production compared to the purchase of MET. And one thing that you also notice um, from all the peaks that you see here going from the first July of, and five years out to April, you'll see that overall the trend is that it's declining. A uh, big reason for that is your uh, conservation ordinance that you utilize as a means to change customers' behaviors. Now that we understand the consumption analysis, we then go into the rate design. And with that, the one thing we want to establish is equity, not only horizontally, but also vertically. What I mean by that is when I'm talking about horizontal equity, it's between customer classes. We want to ensure that each customer class is being allocated costs associated with the demand they place on the system. And then what I mean by vertical equity is, again, in collecting the revenue identified for that customer class by the accounts within that class. So what's the best means to collect? An example, with single family, we want to do a tiered rate structure. With commercial, we think it's more appropriate to do a uniform rate. And we'll get in more details as to why we went with those options. Uh, also, I mentioned that the cost of service will account for line item by line item, how that those costs are incurred, as well as the example of that is the cost of purchased water. Uh, a couple other things, we want to minimize uh, shock to the system and increases in rates. This is why we're doing a planning horizon of five to ten years. Uh, besides that, we also have to take into account, based on our rate structure, we want to continue that conservation principle and people using water efficiently. And if they do use water efficiently and then those that do not, they change behavior, we have to take that into account. And when we take, take that into account, uh, what about price elasticity, which means if if people use water uh, in ex excessively, then most likely they're going to be paying more costs, and will that, that cost, will that change their behavior? So we, th we account for that and put that into the model that every time you see an increase of X percentage in costs, you're most likely going to change your behavior. And besides all that, we also want to make sure that at the end of the day, it's very logical, systematic, and very easy, clear to understand, not only to council and the commissioners, but also to your stakeholders and your constituency, because that makes it that much more easier to implement a smoother transition. 
With that, when we talk about customer classes, I'm going to turn it over to Pierce, uh, my colleague, to go into more of the specific details of the characteristics of every single one of these new established customer classes. And we'll have another break point to answer. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, as Habib said, I'm going to be talking more about how the rate uh, structure is designed for each customer class that we're proposing. Uh, the first piece is those 15 existing customer classes we want to condense into these four. Uh, a lot of them just relate to how the electrical side and the water side currently do the billing system. Uh, so what we're proposing is commercial, irrigation, multifamily, and single family. Starting with single family, just want to again look at consumption and how that's consumed overall. You have these peaks in the summer when irrigation demand is increased, and then you have a lull in the winter, uh, typically around March, when you have the rainy season. To combat that, and based off the direction that the council provided earlier, we want to encourage efficient use of water and continued conservation, uh, particularly in summer months. What we're proposing here are five tiers. The first two tiers will cover typical indoor demand, indoor needs. Um, that will be typically based off your groundwater. When you get into tier three, that's your outdoor irrigation needs demand. Uh, and that's going to be a blend of groundwater and purchased water. When we get into tier four and tier five, the reason the price escalates is because that's the full cost of the purchased water. Uh, purchased water costs about twice as much as pumping groundwater locally. You mean the incremental cost? Yes. Or not the total cost, the incremental cost is the, purchase cost. The acre foot cost of water. Right. And uh, the city, GWP, has a current, um, they pump about 10,000 acre feet of groundwater a year. Uh, total demands about 18, 19,000 acre feet. This five tier rate structure, what does it mean for monthly bills? Purely looking at the rate design, no revenue increases. This is what's shown. The blue line is the proposed. The red line is the existing. Uh, on the bottom, you have units, consumption on the bottom, and the proposed monthly bill on the top. Uh, that green line shows at about 46 units, a lot of water. Uh, typical consumption is about 19 HCF. So at 46 units of consumption with just a rate design, those people will see their bills increase. At the very bottom of the, the line, uh, about 11 less, you'll see that the bill changes, uh, actually increases a little bit, and that's due to how the costs are actually allocated. Another way of saying this is how many people are affected, and so what this graph shows. So, so let me understand the prior slide. The lower, the people who use lower, what is what is the bottom uh, gallon? What what is what is the units for the bottom, uh, bottom axis? HCF. So, so the people who use the least amount, they'll get their rate increased? Marginally, yes. Marginally, they'll get it increased. They'll, they'll see that, that's what that's showing. Uh, at about six units or less, they'll see their increase, yes. Who, can you explain who, who are the people using that amount of water? Uh, there are very few. The poor um, people. In single family house. Cubic feet. I mean, is it, is in, it people in, who, where they're not living there? I mean, what? what? It's typically, you, you could say, townhomes that are individually metered. Uh, I, I use about three acre or three HCF a month. Um, I just live in a townhome, single. I'm one of those low users. The reason your cost is increasing on the low end is not because your variable cost is increasing, but because the fixed cost associated with providing service is increasing. Because it costs more to provide service to people who use the least amount of water? There, there's a fixed no, cost fixed associated with is. providing oh, the water. I there's there's I a bottom level of that. Right, is right now, about 15% of the revenue generated uh, off rates is based off that fixed charge. Uh, we're proposing about a 30% uh, fixed charge total revenue, and that's to be within industry standards. So basically we're undercharging at this point, that's what you're saying? Yes, for, you're not collecting. For the lower uh, amount that people are using. Exactly. 
What this graph shows is the number of users that are affected. Uh, again, to the right of the green line, those users will see their in bill increase um, to the greater extent as you proceed right. Uh, the red is the consumption or the number of accounts in each consumption block uh, for summer, and in red, you see it's con or in blue, you see it's condensed there towards the lower usage because that's winter where most people are uh, just indoor usage only. What does what does the blue represent again? The blue represents uh, accounts in winter, where the red is accounts in summer. And. So that just shows you more the number of accounts. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So as you as the taller the I bar, see. All right. the greater number of the accounts. The number of accounts that are using less are higher in winter than the number of accounts that are using. Right. So the purpose of this slide is just to show that the far majority will see their bills decrease given the rate design. The people to the right who are being uh, less c conservation and less efficient with their water will see their bills increase. The second piece is multifamily. Why are we breaking them out? And for Glendale in particular, multifamily is a very large piece. Uh, it represents about 30,000 units, uh, about 41% of the consumption. Typically, we see that for other agencies, about 10%. So this is a very large group. Uh, the biggest piece of it is the different demand between indoor and outdoor needs, between single family and outdoor. Basically, you don't have a yard to water, you don't have that irrigation need. Uh, also, population density. Among multifamily, you have some unique characteristics, whether the multifamily complex is metered uh, by a master meter or whether it's individually metered. And so we're uh, recommending almost a budget-based system here will, where each unit in the apartment complex or townhome complex gets their own allocation of water. So will you be able to tell whether it's a multifamily if it's uh, individually metered, the, the, the multifamily homes? Yes. Yeah, so if it's individually metered, we have the number of accounts or we have the number of meters. If it's not, uh, if it's master metered, then we have some parcel information that we've already compiled and there'd also be an audit uh, between now and when these rates get proposed for multifamily units. So in our database, it says which one is multifamily, which ones are yes. single family. Okay. Yeah. Uh, similar to single family, we're proposing a tiered rate structure, but in this case, it's three tiers. Again, indoor is tiers one and two. Tier three is discretionary use because that can be water for common area or just additional needs beyond indoor usage. What is efficient? What is efficient? Yeah, super, uh, right, you said it's indoor, we've, common area, what's in between? So what we've done is we've allocated uh, 55 gallons, super efficient for both single family and multifamily is 55 gallons per capita per day. Uh, single family will have a slightly higher tier one allocation than multifamily because their population density is higher. Uh, tier two is 110 uh, units or 110 gallons of water per capita per day. And so that's an efficient use of water. The target for Glendale is 55. Uh, 110 is very reasonable. Uh, and to be within the state mandate of 20 by 2020, uh, 55 is the state target. So where is, uh, I don't understand what is this based on? You, and the other one you said it's based on fixed costs. Uh, in addition to the fixed costs, it's uh, recycled and, and right. purchased. So, what is this based on? This is based on uh, tiers one and two are based, well, tier one is groundwater. Tier two in this case is a blend of groundwater and met water. Tier three is pure met water. <laughs> Looking at commercial and irrigation, the reason we've proposed a uniform rate structure is because it's very difficult to know who's being efficient, and who just needs a lot of water to operate their business. Uh, so rather than arbitrarily setting tiers and being punitive to large businesses that need a, a large amount of water, we've created a blended rate that has groundwater and met water. And this is just an example of different peaks and uses of water. 
Can I ask you a question? I understand that concept with commercial, but why irrigation? Why can't you determine what's efficient with irrigation? There are a few. We don't have farms, so it's not like we have people that need to irrigate rice, so they need more water. Right. Uh, the original purpose of what we're proposing is that the uniform rate structure will be higher than the recycled water rate. And so it's an incentive to go towards recycled water. So it, there, there are, again, opportunities to say to tier irrigation, but that was not discussed as an option. So it's, it's something that could be discussed at a later date? It could be. Uh, typically, irrigation and commercial is uniform rate structure, although there have been uh, attempts to tier such uh, irrigation. That's, that's assuming that we do have the infrastructure in place to do the recycled water, to, to provide the recycled water. Yes. Which, in general, we don't. Right. There is there's sufficient recycled water. Uh, the infrastructure, however, is one of those things that will be discussed later presentation. But it's not just to incentivize people to move towards recycled water, because as Mr. Mnookin said, that's not always available to them. But there's certainly other efficiencies in irrigation that people can implement. Yes. And studies have shown that even a uniform rate structure is sensitive to conservation-based rates. So the thought is, uh, as the more water you use, the, more, the higher your bill is. Uh, we're not recommending a declining block rate that would incentivize additional use of water. Um, can you explain again why you're doing the blended rate for commercial? If, for example, there's a business that is um, that is a high user of water, why would they not pay a higher price? Why does everyone have to support or subsidize that? Is that is that what I'm understanding? Yes, uh, and again, the discussion that's taken place is that we don't want to overly burden large users of water, and there's the assumption that's made that there are private business that are trying to be as efficient with their costs as possible and that they're trying to conserve as much as possible so that large users of water, you don't want to overly penalize them just because they're a large business. Uh, an example would be a large a, a supermarket will use a large amount of water, but it's simply because of the, not necessarily that they're wasting water, it's just that their demands place a larger demand. And will you be getting to this later, or is this a, a good time for me to ask um, who would be deciding um, what those businesses are that would be getting that that sort of break of getting the blended rate? They all would. Uh, everyone. That's the point. Well, I know, but how, who decides as between business A and business B? One's a brewery, and one's a or photocopier. That's, that's who, that's exactly why we're proposing uniform rate, because there's such a broad spectrum of uses, of commercial uses, that you could create a structure, a tier structure, that appears to be reasonable, but it might fit for certain businesses, but then it's not going to make sense for other businesses that they don't have any choice based on the type of commercial use they are, how much water they're using. And even though they are being efficient based on their use, they're using the same amount of, say, another commercial entity that's inefficient. So then because of the different uses, that's going to have to be a factor in trying to ensure a tier structure that fits every single different type of business. So that's what it lends itself to move towards more of a uniform rate that blends all your costs, including groundwater and purchased water. So then it's really structured in a way that as those businesses use more water, they're paying, they're getting allocated based on cost of service, their fair share of groundwater production as well as their fair share of purchased water. So if purchased water increases, their allocation, their cost increases with that. Did you mention a uh, state regulation in the coming years? Uh, you mentioned 55 gallon per capita criteria. Yes. Uh, Can you explain that and what, do you, what exactly is Yes, it's a, a conservation ordinance or, or uh, mandate from the state that says in order to get funding by the year 2020, you need to cut water use by 20 percent or meet certain requirements. And one of the targets that they outline is um, efficient use of water 
and they target about 55 gallons per capita per day as the eventual target that they want to meet. So we've, we've set and designed tier one for both single family and multifamily to that target. And also, just to add to that, we also aware of where your customers are today in regards to water usage, that we didn't want your customers to have to change their behavior day one after this is implemented, and then that's a shock to the system. Uh, that's why we are also showing that tier two is more of what you're typically using, but yet less than what the average is. So then you could slowly transition to that 2020 uh, target amount. Okay. Thank you, Habib. Thank you, Pierce. Uh, Mr. Quintero, one quick clarification that 55 gallons per person per day is for indoor uh, consumption. So the model that Wilden has created will use input, and the input that it will use is what do we plan to spend? because it ultimately tries to recover revenue for the utility to have enough money to operate in. As you know, there are two primary categories of expenditures for a water utility. There's operating expenses, and there's the, the long-term plan to improve our infrastructure. Operating expense is the cost to operate the system, to maintain our assets, and provide high-quality water, all, all three of those um, goals. And the infrastructure improvement program is the cost to repair, refurbish, or replace infrastructure, and it's often called the capital program, capital expense. As far as operating expenses, the utility is subject to unavoidable increases as time goes on. Those include the cost of labor, material, and power. And in material, I'm also including the cost of purchased water from Metropolitan Water District. In our budget, you'll see for next year, it includes a good jump on the purchased water of Metropolitan Water District uh, we anticipate that we'll sell approximately 5% more water. To get that water, we'll have to buy about that much water from Metropolitan Water District. In addition to that, the higher demand will likely increase our consumption of power. Those two are, are pretty significant in, uh, in our operating budget for next year. In addition to that, in 2010 and 2011, because of the economic circumstances, we curtailed our budget, some in 2010 and severely in 2011, and we did have a significant impact on our maintenance of the system as well as water quality. So the proposed budget for operating expenses, it resto restores operating expense to the necessary level. And uh, If you go back to 2009 when we had uh, what we consider to be adequate maintenance levels, it's a 2.8 percent per year increase uh, it brings you to today's budget, which is incorporated in the model. What do you mean by reduction in revenue? You mean conservation by the community, right? Uh, yes. That's a so it's not a reduction in revenue. We asked them to, or I wasn't on council, but the council asked them to uh, conserve and the community conserved. So it's not, it's not something that was uh, not controllable, basically. Well, it wasn't controlled from the perspective that the reduction that we asked the community, the conservation that we asked, was imposed because of water shortages, both regulatory but and we route. exceeded our expectations tremendously. Right. We, we implemented the, according to the city's ordinance, we implemented a level of conservation. People used less water, paid lower bills, and so the utility received less revenue. Right. So it was a revenue reduction in that sense. Okay. Just so it's clear that... It wasn't a lost revenue somewhere by the action of the council. It was conservation by the community. No, of course, of course. It, it, was, it was money that didn't flow into GWP and stayed in the residents' pockets right. from a money point of view, and water that was not available was not sold. <laughs> this is a slide that we presented to city council during the budget uh, in May of 2011. This is some statistical information that we keep on the operation of the system. And it's very interesting to me that the, the top four show you how the system operates. And if you look at, let's see if I can. The right column shows you our goals in these different categories. And we were, this is where we were in May, projecting to, uh, to hit the various metrics. And as far as our total main breaks and leaks, the system performs really well. We don't have that many main breaks and leaks. In addition, we measure how many 
services are out for how many hours. We call that total service hour interruption. And we have a, a metric that's pretty good. Uh, at 31,000, we would be at 99.99% reliability. So we exceed that right now. But if you look at the things that we do on an annual basis to maintain the system, which are the four bottom metrics, valve maintenance, we aim to turn half the valves in the system once a year. In the years past, we were able to do that. This last year, we were not able to accomplish even half of that, half of the goal. Why not? Because we cut our maintenance budget. Same thing as fire hydrant maintenance. We have approximately 3,500 fire hydrants in the system, just a little bit shy of that. Our plan is to maintain every hydrant once a year, and that's consistent with AWWA standards. Last year, we were not even able to get to one-third of that for the same reason. Same as our reservoir cleaning, we were able to do only two when our plans, our scheduled maintenance of the reservoirs was calling for cleaning six. Is the water safe if, if, if we're not maintaining the reservoirs? Our water is safe, but we're concerned that on the long-term basis, the lack of maintenance would have significant water quality impacts. Moving to the infrastructure improvement program, we look at this as a long-term program, and it's a program that has the projects necessary to comply with regulations, where we really don't have a choice but to do. And we have some projects that are recommended based on a favorable rate of return. For example, drilling a well may cost money today, but after a few years produces water that is cheaper and actually pays for itself in savings for the residents. Overall, the approach is based on risk, and risk is the probability that something will fail versus the consequence of something failing. And there's some examples of that. One of the examples recently is the, the gas company's um, explosion in San Bruno. And the regulation that came down from the PUC was that if you have a gas line that goes over an earthquake fault, you have to put an interruptible or, or an automatic shutoff valve. So what the PUC really told them is where the probability of failure is higher, you need to invest some money in your infrastructure. The same thing, I don't know if you remember a few years ago, there was a bridge that failed in Minneapolis. And it was a bridge that failed because they were not aware of the condition that the bridge was in. Our approach is to take assessment of what condition our assets are in and then analyze the risk. Are they likely to fail? And what happens if they fail? What's the, con what's the consequence? And for some things you say, well, you know what, it's such a small thing, it doesn't matter if it fails. We'll go fix it when it does. But there's other things that are really critical and for those, we put a higher risk factor, and we include those in our capital program. Having that kind of a risk ranking has allowed us to adjust as our, as our finances have adjusted over time. But nevertheless, we are at a point where we recommend certain projects to be done. This is our infrastructure improvement program for the next five years. You can see that fundamentally, the program has been reduced over time, and it's the, the area that we're looking to focus on is water mains, hydrants, and meters. This particular year that we're in right now, we are looking to finish some water source improvements, uh, like wells, in some specific areas of the system. We are looking to invest some more money in pumping plant improvements, and by 1213, we will have finished upgrading the pump stations in the whole city, the mechanical and electrical systems. And the staple after that is repair, repairing those tuberculated pipes that I showed you that we have a lot of in the city. Everything else, all the other categories that we have, represent fairly nominal investments. If we were in a better financial position, we have lower risk projects that we would be happy to, to embark on and improve the system even further. The benefits of the capital improvement program, the infrastructure improvement, is it keeps our main breaks and leaks very low. We have a low number. It's uh, compared to other cities next to us, we have about a third of the rate of failure of pipes. And of course, when a pipe fails, there's damage that needs to be repaired, there's repairs that need to be made, uh, and there is inconvenience to the residents. Our capital projects maintain and improve flow and pressure throughout the city. They continue fire protection the residents can count on. They improve water quality and continue regulatory compliance. Overall, that, along with our maintenance expense, make the system reliable. And in our definition of reliability is having water available for your needs without you having to think about it. Lack of reliability is the opposite. Our, our needs? You mean the city council's and the commission's needs? 
needs. Uh, and all the ratepayers you represent? Or, yes. So the taxpayers' needs? Yes. Ratepayers? Yes. Our customers? Yes. So with those two inputs, we have a five-year financial plan. And working together with Will Dan, the financial plan in, in detail, you see a very high-level summary, but the financial plan in detail has been embedded into their computer model. And actually, as we make changes into the plan, the model updates automatically. And what we would really like to do is show you on an annual basis, as we bring budgets to you, we'd like to run the model and show you what the projected revenue requirements would be on a, pretty much for the first time in the utilities history on a very well, very thorough uh, basis. What you will notice here is the second of the drivers uh, that are calling for a revenue increase at this time, and that is the year-end cash balance for 1011. We are $11.5 million below zero. You have the beginning cash balance? We have a negative cash balance. The beginning of the year? At the beginning of 11 12, yes. No, what was it at the beginning of 10-11? Oh, it was, it was slightly positive at the beginning of 10-12. Sorry, I How it. slightly was it? I want to say maybe... Five million about? I don't recall off the top of my head, but that well, sounds about You do right. the math there, it's about five million. And uh, why do we have a negative uh, balance at the end of 10-11? Because capital projects? Uh, there's a number of reasons. And uh, we'll get into those reasons in just a minute. Let's see, okay. where is that slide? Yeah, change circumstance. We, we, you don't have to skip ahead to it. We yeah, can, if we'll it's going to come up, that's okay. There, there are uh, a number of reasons, uh, and we'll cover those again in a slide. Let me give you a brief preview. One was the uh, lower water sales because of conservation that resulted in about $8 million of lower revenue. And uh, the increase in cost of materials in 2008 and 2009, I don't know if you recall that period of time, but there was a time when China was buying every bit of steel that there was available in the United States. No, I don't recall that period. Um, so, I actually, I, okay, I apologize. Let me uh, give you a little bit more on the historical and answer some of the question of why the, the changes have been made. I showed you some of the slides from a 2007 presentation. You recall this slide here, which was the CDM plan. I can barely see those amounts. What are they? 9, 14, and 12? 9, 14, and 12. And, and the recommendation was to continue rate increases for the foreseeable future and eventually drop down to a low number. And the discussion at the time was that we would have a low number of rate increases sustainable each and every year. A small one, predictable one, but each and every year. There was also a recommendation to borrow $50 million in 2008 and then again borrow $37 million in 2010. And, and then again the need was forecast to borrow again in 2013. So the first three years rates of rate increases were approved. You approved the fourth one last November. We issued the bond in 2008 and deferred the bond in 2010. We did not issue that bond. That's one of the change circumstances. At that time, we showed council that our neighbors, and this is the, the swimming pool that we compare ourselves in, is our neighbors, Burbank, Crescenta, Pasadena. At that time, they'd all had some rate increases almost each and every year of the past six years. And at that time, Glendale had not had a rate increase five of the last six years which resulted in, a, in an urgent need to have a rate increase. At that time, we projected the next three years what the proposal was for Glendale, which was adopted, and what the proposals were by our neighbors. Since then, we've implemented those, uh, the 9, 14, and 12. The neighbors have implemented rate increases that are higher than were those shown at that time, than were projected at that time. This is a listing of the 20-year capital improvement program that we showed you in 2007. Some of the projects have been completed. Obviously, you're familiar with Chevy Chase 968, our water meter replacement program, some water quality improvements, uh, installing a third pumping unit in a very critical pump station, getting an emergency generator and adapting our pump stations and a pump to pump in emergencies. Whereas other projects are ongoing, some haven't started, and some have been delayed. 
we've had to adjust our capital program to reflect economic reality. So we have delayed uh, some of the projects and not started others on schedule. There was a there was a recycled water system expansion that was delayed. There was such a project. There was a project at that time, and we never took it on. Brief overview of Chevy Chase 968 Reservoir and Pump Station. That's fairly recent. And also the Central Avenue Cleaning and Lining Project, which again is the main thrust of our capital programs in the future, is to take pipes that look like that and make them look like this. We have nine large projects like that slated throughout the city. This is a view over the last 12 years, and you can see that when the first study was done around 2003, the capital investment in the city increased a little bit. The last four years, it appears the capital program has increased dramatically, and what this really reflects is the investment in the, in the Chevy Chase 968 reservoir and pump station, along with a meter replacement program throughout the city. That is a, it's just over $45 million. If you take just over $10 million from each of the last four years, you end up at a level of a capital investment, uh, which is right around at the 10 to $12 million mark, which is where we think is uh, probably the level we need to continue for the next two or three years before tapering down again. The money that you see here, the $130 million that we've spent over the last 12 years, has been spent in these projects or categories of projects, Chevy Chase being the most expensive project we've taken, undertaken the last dozen years. You remember this chart from the 2007 presentation? I showed it to you earlier. No, this no, show no, I don't. I was earlier in the presentation, Mr. Manukin. I can go back to that if you like, but it's, it's here again. And it shows the city's reserve oh, policy. I don't remember it from 2007. Oh, okay. The, the chart also projected the cash balance of the utility. Had we implemented all those rate increases, the first three years the council approved, and the ones that were projected for the future. So had we done that and things had panned out the way we thought they would pan out, we would be seeing right around now, we would be seeing our balance being at a, just, over, just over zero and looking rosy to, to go up. We modified this chart and added a negative portion to the axis because the actual balance where we are today, as I mentioned, is negative $11.5 million. So we're off track. And so to your question of what happened and what changed, we had a dramatic increase in the cost of materials. The cost of materials goes up every year, and we have projected some of it in forecasting the cost of that project. But what hit us at that year was, was dramatic, and it added to the cost of the reservoir. It added in the order of approximately 2 to $3 million. We had a, the drought and regulatory water shortage, which resulted in lower revenue to the utility of about $8 million over those two years. We had a program to replace water meters, which merged into the larger program of Smart Grid AMI, which increased the cost for the water department with the commensurate increase in the benefits to the customers that come with that. But nevertheless, that added uh, to, uh, to the capital expenses that we hadn't planned. The smart meter uh, increase? Yes, smart grid AMI, right. Was it, wasn't, that, wasn't there a bond issue for that and government grants to pay for that? The government grants are for the electric portion of it. The government grants did not uh, accrue it to the water system at all. And was there a bonds issue to cover any of these costs, or was it paid out of the reserves? We have not issued any bonds since 2008, so this was all paid from reserves. The last thing that did change is we did not issue a bond in, in 2010, as had been recommended by CDM, which drove us into, into the red. Uh, had we had that, we would have a probably a more positive cash position today. As a result, we adjusted. We had, at the beginning of the year, a slightly positive cash balance. We deferred a lot of capital projects that were in the 10-11 approved budget. We did not do those in order to minimize the cash balance shortfall at the end of the year. So that's, that's our plan for the next five years in terms of O&M and in terms of capital expenses. I have a question. Why was there no bond issued for smart meter? Was that a I will defer that to, to Mr. Steiger. A little before my time. Was that a policy direction from council? Was it a policy decision from GWP? 
So the smart meters fell between the last bond issuance and today. And the last bond issuance did not uh, consider smart meters. In fact, it was strictly for infrastructure improvement. On the water side, as Peter has said, he's laid that out. On the electric side, there was a substantial amount of system improvement required for uh, inc improved reliability, circuit upgrade, voltage upgrade, and so on. So those bonds that were issued back in early 2008 uh, reflected those costs. The smart grid was initiated after that. So we don't, as Paul, we don't then um, issue bonds to pay for specific projects that come up sort of unexpectedly like that one? We can. Okay, we Let can. me ask a couple questions about PAYGO. I think you have some more PAYGO information later in the presentation, but if you don't mind, um, was the transition that you talked about as being a goal to PAYGO, was that a, a direction from council? Is that where that came from? No, that is management's belief that we need to be able on a routine basis to generate enough earnings that we can pay for capital programs on an ongoing basis. And is the goal to go completely to PAYGO or for a certain percentage to be PAYGO? Well, we haven't settled on a percentage. The reality is that there are projects out there in the horizon, hopefully more than 10 years away, that will require larger expenses expenditures than we can possibly save up. Uh, and those will probably have to bond. So the goal then is not 100 percent pay go. It's, it's some, some percentage, I would assume. The goal is as much pay go as possible for routine uh, infrastructure improvements in balance with not increasing rates too high. Okay. I know we have another pay go discussion coming up, but. No fixed, in short answer to your question, no fixed uh, percentage determined at this time. We've got lots of uh, statistics under operating expenses, but we have no statistics on uh, labor. Can you or the finance uh, department uh, give us an idea of the cost for uh, labor at GWP? And I'd like to have it broken between uh, management and the non-managers. We can certainly do that, Mr. Quintero. Uh, I can tell you as a, as a brief first response is that our labor is not a major driver for our expenses. Right, but it's a driver nevertheless, and the yes. fact that it's not listed at all I find puzzling. You know offhand the percentage, because I've heard that number before, uh, a general percentage of what labor is. We, we did have it for you during the budget presentation this year. Yeah. Does anybody remember what that number was? Our labor is below $5 million. Our total O&M expense is over $50 million. So the so percentage then is? A little less than 10 percent of the total budget. And the labor is in there. It's not broken out separately because we have labor in O&M, we have labor in capital. But we'll be happy to break that up. And I'd like to have a sure. more uh, in-depth look. Just a clarification. When you present that, is there a way for you to break – is your department – is management also considered – does that also capture your um, – your professionals, your engineers, that sort of thing. Is there a way to break that out between your engineer managers and your sort of manager managers? We, we break it out any which way you like. We, 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 did, we did that during the budget as well. Yeah. Okay. We, 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 made, have, we, we have that available. We made the split between professional, technical, right. and management. We began to. We didn't used to separate those, but we did during the budget presentation. So that'll be an easy number we can get our hands on. Thank you. Other questions right now before we plow onward? Okay. Very good. Uh, thank you. Uh, at this point, the, uh, so w you understand what the inputs are in terms of what the revenue requirements are. You understand the philosophy of the rate structure that, that is being proposed. And so I'd like to invite, I think Habib will be coming up first, to present the financial alternatives that we have with the new rate structure and these financial inputs. Okay, thank you once again. Uh, as Peter just uh, reviewed and summarized, the, what we have to do now is take the financial state that the enterprise is in, as well as the rate design objectives, plus ensuring that we're keeping compliance with the guidelines of Prop 218 and looking at conservation principles, things of that sort, where there's a lot of competing objectives that we essentially have to balance and make sure that ultimately we end up with the with the ends that we targeted and ensure that the means we get there is in compliance with all of those objectives that I just mentioned. Uh, go ahead. So with the revenue requirements, one thing that Peter also uh, made reference to was one big component of this was to actually enable the agency and staff to be able to utilize our model on a budgetary, as part of the budgetary process. 
So in doing so, what we did was actually look at their financial statements, their financial spreadsheet worksheets that utilize on an annual basis, and we embedded it into the model as well as linked it up to, to our formula so it could be updated annually. This seems to make more sense as opposed to having the budgetary process be independent of what is the result to, to rates and, and monthly bills. Uh, we also accounted for capital improvement plans, the proposed bond issue of 2012, transitioning to PAYGO, and in doing so, that's why we also are looking at a longer planning horizon. In regards to Prop 218, you can only notice for five years at the maximum, but when you're looking at transition to PAYGO, you also want to make sure you account for any capital improvements or infrastructure improvements that are a, very, a pretty significant expense in one particular year. So in that year, you don't see a huge increase in rates just to cover that one-time cost. So you want to make sure you build up so you have a smooth transition and you cover uh, infrastructure expenses. A couple other additional factors. Best management practices as they relate to, as I mentioned, your sanitary to the CUWCC, as well as meeting the 20% uh, by 2020 of the state in reduction in water usage. Uh, we always want to ensure revenue stability. And then also part of the transition and doing a 10-year planning horizon is to make sure that we also keep, keep into account it being palatable to your constituency, your rate payers. We do not want to have them be shocked to and, and adjust in a means that yet they have to make, change their behavior in the first month that they see a bill. But really think of it as, a, as an overall plan to reach a goal in five to ten years. Besides the technical components, we also want to make sure that we are working in concert with the agency, with public workshops, and with major stakeholders, whether it's uh, the multifamily developments uh, or uh, commercial entities, that we make sure that we work together in those type of workshops. Also, ensure that you have compliance with your existing bond covenants and any future bond covenants, such as the proposed 2012 bond issue. And then continue to search reliability as it relates to ensuring that you're keeping in line with uh, your infrastructure improvement plan, uh, whether it be debt financing or PAYGO. So in regards to debt financing and PAYGO, one thing that the mayor made a reference to was are we doing 100% PAYGO? Are we transitioning to that? My answer to that would be no, it's not 100%, but what we want to do is provide more flexibility to the agency and management to decide whether or not what's more beneficial, to debt finance or to continue the PAYGO as opposed to being, uh, being more of um, subject to the market. So I thought it was important to point out some of the pros and cons within both um, financial structures. With debt financing, the benefits that you have there is, one, you're able to create the structure in a way to uh, optimize revenue cash flow, your cash flow for your revenues. You also are able to take advantage of historical lows in, in tax exempt municipal bonds. And also one thing to point out is that you also get the funds up front, so then you can expedite critical infrastructure improvements. A negative would be, as you may all be aware, you, you are paying interest. Uh, in addition to that, you, as part of the bond covenants, you always have to show 25% at the minimum of additional revenue for, in regards to your net income to show that you do have a reserve built up to cover the, to have that as security for the bondholders. For PAYGO, what you're looking at is more of a fiscal responsibility. You pay for what you can at that point in time. Also, you're not uh, restricted to the volatility of the market. Uh, and then looking to the point that you are confined to needing to do debt financing because you don't have any reserves built up, then if the market has high interest rate, you don't really have a choice. Uh, so that gives you more flexibility as well. Uh, the one thing that I would say is a, is a minus in regards to uh, PAYGO is there would be some improvements, whether it's a, a big pump station, wherever the case may be, that is a benefit not only to the existing customers, but also future customers. So based on the lifespan and the longevity of that particular infrastructure improvement, you may, it may make more sense to do debt financing so then all customers that benefit from it pay, as opposed to the ratepayers of today are paying for the benefits of future customers. So that could be one of the policy decisions. But basically, we want to make this more policy decision as opposed to you're, you're tied to having to do debt financing. Go ahead. 
Now, I did mention a bunch of different parameters, a lot of objectives that you have to balance. And what we have here is what we call is guide, but it's basically a dashboard that incorporates all of these components into one uh, viewpoint that enables you to look at a lot of different aspects. Granted, some of the information here is not quite uh, legible, but that's not important as of right now. We will have the ability to bring the model up. But I just want to point out the, just the major components. On the, top, on the top portion is just what is your overall revenue, what is your net income, what is the percentage of revenue increase you need. And on the middle left is all everything in orange, all your inputs by the user, whether it be what is the escalation factor for materials and supplies, what is going to increase um, based on metropolitan water district, what is the density factors for single family compared to multifamily. And then on the middle right, what you have is your financial outlook of the enterprise, whether it be your expenses, which shows up on bars, but Pierce is going to get more into that when we talk about specific scenarios. On the bottom left is your financial thresholds or financial parameters, where we identify what is an appropriate uh, target for your reserves, whether it be operations, we base it on a target of number of days, a range of 72 days to 90 days is where you want to be, or what is the minimum reserve uh, fund reserves you want for your repair and rehabilitation for PAYGO. And then on the bottom right is whatever changes you make, it shows what is the impact to the customers in relation to monthly bills. And what we have is a comparison of your existing rate structure compared to the proposed rate structure, as well as what is the dollar amount impact uh, that's very clear and concise based on whether you're a very low user to an average user to your high users. So those are some of the items that we're able to uh, provide to you for discussion purposes if you wish. With that, we, we, we worked with staff to go over many, many uh, scenarios and options and we, through these meetings, we were able to drill down to three viable ones that are uh, for you to digest and understand and ask questions and we also included one additional one of just what if you kept revenue static? What does that mean to your to your utility? And with that, I'll turn it over to Pierce to go over the very specific scenarios that we're presenting today. Hello again. Uh, as Sabib mentioned, we're proposing f showing four different rate scenarios or revenue increase scenarios. Each scenario was developed as a five-year rate plan, but with a ten-year financial outlook. Uh, that, again, as to be mentioned, to anticipate future needs. We're recommending a four-year Prop 218 noticing, even though by the Prop 218 you can do five years' worth of noticing. We're recommending four years of rate increases. And then the scenarios that we're going to cover today are the recommended, revenue static, basic business needs, and I, an ideal situation. Scenario one, the key objectives here are to ensure compliance with your bond covenants, reserves, your operating and your res repair and replacement reserve would be met in five years, that balance, uh, funds short-term and long-term needs, a gradual transition to pay-go, stabilizes future rate increases, and then this is a big one for other scenarios that I'll show later. And so the re revenue adjustments are three years of 5%, a 4%, and then the fifth year that wouldn't be noticed would be an additional 4%. Taking those rate scenarios, or those rates, this is what the financial outlook looks like. Just going to spend a little bit more time on this slide because the other three scenarios have the same format. The bars represent the district's or the agency's cost. Uh, the blue bar... <coughs> Just the biggest piece is your operations and maintenance costs. The green is your debt service. The teal or the purple uh, are both capital related or infrastructure related uh, costs. It's just whether it's being paid from past revenues or existing revenues. So whether it's out of the repair and replacement fund or whether it's that year's revenue. The lines that you see, the top one is your revenue. You want to see that revenue just above the green bar. Uh, that means you're covering all of your day-to-day -day expenses. The reserves are the two bottom lines. The bottom line 
is your operating reserve. And as you see, that, kind of, that gets above those little dash marks at about eight, nine million, because that's above your, your reserve requirement. And then the blue line is the additional uh, repair and replacement reserve. Taking a look at what if we do nothing? What if we keep revenue static but implement the rate design? Uh, we're going to continue operating at an, a deficit. CIP will have to be deferred as there's not enough money in the coffers. Reliability is jeopardized. Compliance with the, the 2008 bond issuance is at risk in future years. Uh, there is no ability to bond that $60 million uh, in 2012, and reserves are not funded throughout the course of the study. Revenues increases are zero percent across the board. Early, earlier, you know, you're saying if we don't do anything, we're going to have an operating operating deficit. Earlier, when we looked at the financials, it was we had a deficit because of capital expenditures. Uh, so, operating deficit, I don't agree with uh, with your conclusion that if we don't do anything. We're going to be running into operating deficit. If you don't do anything, your revenues stay static, as shown, but your costs continue to climb. Metropolitan's uh, instituting a, rev a rate increase effective January 1st of 2012. Uh, it's jumping up to $800 an acre foot, and that's a large portion of your uh, cost increase. And as, as Peter mentioned earlier, you have uncontrollable costs that are climbing regardless of a revenue increase or not. Uncontrollable costs in terms of? Uh, outside the GWP's control, uh, increasing, uh, mainly increasing purchase water costs through Metropolitan. Power costs going up? Power, Power costs, costs as well, labor costs. Material costs. As well. Yes. Uh, and so with no revenue increases, this is the financial outlook of GWP water. Uh, as you can see, it's unsustainable. Looking at kind of the minimal outlook, what if we said basic business needs held revenues just above net income? So we're covering our bond compliance. We're not building reserves at any level, at any rate. It's much more of a reactive approach. So what I mean by that is uh, if you have an emergency R&R, repair and replacement project, you don't have the money in the bank or in reserves, to, uh, so it's reactive. Uh, reliability is jeopardized because you don't have those reserves. The revenue adjustments here would be 2%, 0%, 1, and then it starts to ramp up in later years because you're kicking the can down the road a little bit, uh, 7 and 8, and if we projected 10 years out, you'd see increased uh, revenue increases as well. This is what the financial outlook looks like. Uh, as you can see, you're just covering your costs, but you're not building any reserves. You're still staying at an, a fund deficit. I have a question. Please. With your scenario two, looking at the graph there, why would you show a total required revenue constant and then the um, total reserves going down so much? Why did you choose to show it that way? Well, so what happens is any, any amount of the bar above the red line causes a, a decrease in your fund and your, your operating balance. And so each year you're not covering that cost, and so that incremental causes a decline in the operating fund balance. Because, I mean, in reality, we're not going to be able to go that low in reserves, and Correct. so that's where we're actually really increasing the total re revenue that's required way up instead of staying constant, that chart. Well, right. So what, what we're showing here is if you do nothing, this is right. what's going to happen, and it's unsustainable. And then another final alternative is an ideal situation uh, for GWP, full compliance with bond covenants, both the existing and the proposed 2012. Reserves are fully funded in year three as opposed to year five in the recommended. It's a quicker transition to PAYGO, um, and those revenue adjustments are just a little bit higher in the earlier years at a 9, 8, 6, and a 1%, and 
and then one percent thereafter. The financial outlook here is similar to what we saw in the recommended, but it's just at an accelerated rate. With that, we'll take any further questions. Questions at this time? Okay. I don't see any questions right now. So I'd like to summarize with uh, recommendations. First, by going through the drivers. The drivers are the council direction to develop better rate structure, as we've shown here. We've, we've come up with a number of proposals for what we consider to be a much more efficient rate structure. Uh, the negative cash balance that the GWP Water Division currently has. Unavoidable increases in external costs. Uh, the major driver there is the ex escalating cost of met water. And I want to be clear that these, uh, these adjustments, these rate adjustments that we're talking about include that. Okay, normally we have uh, a base rate and an adjustable where we come back, as we mentioned earlier, twice a year. These include that. So this is a total. This is an aggregate uh, adjustment. System maintenance needs, uh, as Peter went through, I think, in detail. Necessary infrastructure improvements, also Peter uh, outlined that in detail. And continuing the 2007 financial plan, which actually laid out where we should be today and in the, in the coming four or five years. More recently, uh, our water bonds and our water rating have been uh, reevaluated by both Fitch and Moody's. Fitch maintained our current, uh, our current rating at AA with a negative outlook and essentially said what could trigger a rating action, failure to adopt a rate increase needed to preserve healthy operating margins, as you've seen. Uh, and a material weakening from projected financial margins as a result of our uh, planned issuance uh, for bonding in 2012. Essentially, uh, what they're saying is we need to uh, do what we're recommending here in terms of rate adjustments and bonding uh, and ongoing delays in restoring liquidity levels, and that's, that's clear from their standpoint. Moody's uh, lowered the Glendale Water Revenue uh, rating uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, and I'll go through this in a minute, uh, is because Moody's has taken a different set of criteria to evaluate municipal bonds. Uh, so we, uh, we've been hit with uh, one of their first rounds of reevaluation and at the same time uh, talked about our financial position. So what, again, could make uh, rating go up in Moody's eyes, significant improvement in history of maintaining financial reserves and trend of increasing debt service uh, coverage levels after the new debt is issued. Essentially, again, what we're recommending here. What could make the rating go down, further deterioration of financial reserve position, and the inability to maintain debt service coverage levels primarily over our rate covenants. The folks from Will Dan outlined a number of recommendations. Uh, we actually can only recommend three of those uh, for the obvious financial continuity of the water division. Uh, the basic business needs, as was just outlined, uh, which includes, in every case, includes the rate redesign. We strongly feel that the rate redesign, uh, as directed by the Council and the Commission both, uh, is critical to, uh, to the ongoing uh, health and customer efficiency for the, uh, for the utility. The basic business needs, uh, we, we mentioned, it funds short-term capital projects, funds O&M, but no net income for four years, so essentially keeps us flat in terms of where our, uh, our capital is today. The recommended uh, alternative, again, is the rate redesign and revenue increases of 5%, 5%, 5% in the next three years, and then 4% uh, in the uh, following year. It funds short and long-term capital program. It funds our O&M. It funds reserves and gets us back uh, to our $11.2 million uh, reserve funding in a five-year time frame. And then, of course, the ideal, which basically does what the recommended program does, but in a much quicker uh, manner, uh, would see revenue increases of 9%, 8%, 6%, and 1%. Our recommendation, our strong recommendation, is to implement the rate redesign, initiate multi-year revenue increases of 5%, 5%, 5, and 4, and have these effective January of each year. That would also uh, correlate those same increases with 
the MET increases that we see at the same time each year. What we did is uh, we did a consumer reports style uh, rating system to basically show you uh, not, not how to buy a car, but necessarily how to, how to uh, evaluate what we, are, uh, what we are proposing here. Got it. Thank you. Essentially, this is our recommendation here. And if you notice, in every case, whether it's conservation funding, pricing, long-term O&M funding, funding short-term capital needs, funding long-term capital needs through PAYGO, uh, minimize and stabilize the future rate increase requirement, fully funding re revenues, and minimize customer impact. Uh, this particular recommendation covers either fully covers or partially covers all of these objectives. In every other case, other than ideal, which except for the customer impact, um, only some are, are shown as uh, meeting those objectives. And we wanted to also show you the impact of the first rate increase uh, in relationship to our neighboring water utilities, and that's what we've done. The very first bar here is where our rates currently are. Now, this is based on the average residential user in Glendale at 19 HCF per month. This is where that user is today. The upper part of the bar represents the variable charge, the lower part of the bar represents the fixed charge. If you recall from the Wildan presentation, one of our objectives was to increase the fixed, decrease the variable, and what that does is that helps to maintain the fixed cost of the utility regardless of the volume used. Um, and that's very, very important as we move on. So what we have here is this is today's rate. This is what we would look like if uh, we put the recommended, recommended uh, rate increase in place in 2012 in relationship to our other utilities. I think one interesting thing to note is that even with the revenue increase in 2012, the average user would actually pay slightly less because of the rate design. It still shows that we're well below the system average of $76 per month. Uh, the only utility surrounding Glendale that's lower is Burbank. Every other one of our neighboring utilities is higher and quite higher in some cases. So we are still in relatively good position from a competitive standpoint. That's very important to us and I would assume it's very important to you too. On the bonding side, we recommend a $60 million uh, bond for the water uh, division in 2012 and simultaneously, and we'll come before you uh, later this year to discuss uh, the same issue on the electric side, and there are certain benefits and efficiencies associated with bonding all at the same time, so we're recommending uh, this bonding structure to be done at the same time. That's why I mentioned the electric side. The bond process, uh, we issued a, a uh, RFP for both bond counsel and financial advisor in July. We've received the proposal, so we have them in-house, and we can put them into effect at any given time. Uh, some of the reasons very good reasons to bond right now is that uh, bonding rates are pretty much at an all-time low and there's also a low supply level of bonds which would assure we believe a, the most favorable position uh, in going to market. We can also and we so because of smart grid we can now offer monthly billing as you know our customers receive bi-monthly billing. Uh, we are proposing to do that sometime in 2012. As I mentioned, Smart Grid now allows us to be able to do that. Customers will have more information about their water usage. Monthly bills have lower impact than bi-monthly bills, and we've heard that from customers uh, on many, many occasions. And it's a more consistent cash flow to the utility. So this is something else we would uh, suggest and recommend. Won't that increase our postage and printing costs? It will, yes. There is a cost associated with that. It's about $150,000 to the water utility. So yes, there is a, a cost. <clears throat> so we are, we are asking for direction, and the direction would be to proceed with the Proposition 218 process for the recommended revenue increase scenario. And that Proposition 218 process would be a four-year uh, process, as we mentioned, it's a 45-day process, but it would be for the four-year 
recommendation. And that process does not imply uh, approval by the board or recommendation by the commission at this time. It only allows us to go out and start the process, uh, which what, – What process? What, it's it's what? called the uh, Proposition 218 process. And what, what does it do? What is it? We have to uh, we have to notify every single property owner in the uh, in the city, give them 45 days to comment uh, on the rate increases. Correct. So what we would do is we would give the recommended <clears throat> or recommended scenario, and then still have to come back to you for approval. In, uh, in how, but how can you notify every single rate payer? We do that. We Isn't that kind of difficult to do? We we did it last year. We uh, we do it anytime there's a rate. We have to by law. Uh, we, what if someone comes and says, oh, I didn't get notification? It's, it's incredibly important for us to make sure that every uh, property owner ha gets notification. So in some cases... I didn't get notification. I'm sure you did. <laughs> I'm sure you did. <laughs> we have a process. Can you prove it? Uh, the, an the answer is you, you do keep record of your mailings. Yeah. So you're obligated to mail it utilizing U.S. mails recognizing there'll probably be a certain percentage that for various reasons people either won't receive or won't, won't acknowledge or think they receive. Why did you decide to um, not include the final year of the five-year possible notice period under 218? Uh, you mean last year? Uh, no, you said that the, the next round, that your, if your recommendation shows, you, you could actually notice the residents for a fifth we could. Year of billing increases, but we could. We just felt. Is that, that to avoid the shock yes. factor? Yes. Yeah. Actually, the rates would, would any increase beyond that is is less than the initial increases, so it's not much of a shock. But we just felt that at this point that was the most palatable. Oh, way. So it's a little conservatism on your side. My other question is about the um, the uh, somewhat negative bond uh, rating from the two bond uh, rating agencies. Uh, you sound. Uh, very optimistic about the saleability of the pro proposed bonds, and I wondered if you wanted to comment on that um, optimism in light of the negative bond rating. We uh, <clears throat> we hold regular conferences with uh, many of the financial organizations that we deal with on a regular basis, uh, and to an organization, we've been told that regard that these are still very very good uh, good ratings and that given today's marketability, we should have no problem at all not only selling but getting an extremely low, low rate. So we are, are the people that we deal with on a regular basis, the financial uh, groups, continue to tell us that. So we and did I understand one of the slides correctly? I don't have it in front of me, but that um, part of the um, what was included in the criteria by one of the rating agencies was uh, they were looking for an indication of our city's willingness to issue a new bond. <clears throat> that is correct, yes. Thank you. Mr. Quintero? Uh, yeah, my questions are on the bond uh, ratings. So, AA, uh, do you have a number? Does finance, I don't see the treasurer in the audience, uh, does someone have a number on AA and single A and triple B? You mean the actual rating? Yeah. Uh, yeah the the rating. The actual uh, interest Please. rate, right? It, we, we won't know till we go to market. Well, but currently, I currently. know you won't know till you go currently to market. It's, but what it's, are they? It's slightly less than four percent. Right. So four percent for what? Double A. Uh, for our double A, and even for our uh, A A three my A three, yeah. It's still, that 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 changes very very little in terms of uh, interest rate. In just some process before I move on, I would like to do questions now, hear from the public, and then do any comments after that. I have uh, two questions. Um, one is, so there are three alternatives that you showed, and then you had one that you recommended. If you had your choice, you would obviously go with the one called ideal. Right. Um, um, but you're, you're recommending the recommended, which is short of that. Is your objective... Or would your objective still be to get to the ideal or the the, um, the results that the ideal would give you? And if it is, how do you get from the rec what, what recommended gets you to your ideal? I understand the question. <clears throat> the real difference between ideal and recommended is how quickly we get back to 
our, uh, our objective of $11.2 million of reserves, and that's the only difference. One gets us there in about five years. One gets us there almost immediately, within about a year and a half, two years. Okay, so even if we were to adopt recommended, we'd still get to where our goal is, we will just get in there. a longer period That's of time. Correct. That's okay. correct. My second quick question I had was had to do with um, – uh, with AMI and the amount of data that will flow back to customers in more real time, um, will GWP offer e-bills so that we don't have to mail every month if, if a customer opts in to receiving we the bills will. online? We will. I just, can't I just can't tell you when. But, yes, that's part of the, uh, the smart grid objective. So that could be some way to offset additional postage oh, yes. oh, yeah. um, costs. Thank you. All right. Thank you. With the rate increases, I mean, let's look at the one that's ideal. So uh, let's think of it as accelerating. So you've got your foot on the gas really heavy for a year one, two, three, and then when we hit our reserves of 11 million, we're backing off yes. and going to a much lower increase. That's correct. 1%. That, that's correct. And possibly a 1% you would project for the fifth year. Correct. Now, on these percentages, are these based on the uh, – are they a percentage of a base year or is it a cumulative? So the first year is 9 percent, and then it's – the next year is 8 percent of that 109, that, yes. and correct. then it's 6 percent of that 117 or 18. I mean, is that how, yes. how we're looking at that? Not off of a base? No. In other words, it's – yeah. It's like, compound. Compound. Yeah. That's so correct. what would that be? I mean, someone do the math for the ideal and then the – um, about 25 percent. So recommended. It, it would be about 26, 27 percent from the actual increase, 27 to 20. At the end of the fourth year. Yeah. Yep. Compared to the base year, if we pick the right. current level as the base. You think that's kind of high? In for the the full for a consumer. I mean, let's talk. I mean, for the agency, it's ideal. I mean, that's we know how you feel about that. It's ideal, but for the consumer, don't you think that would? That's a significant well, that, that's, impact. That's why we're recommending the uh, the rate, tiered? The, the tiered. Yeah, because that takes the bite out of it. So would that exactly. hold true? I mean, at the end of that fourth year, despite the tiered uh, or in light of the tiered rates, would it still be a a minimal impact on the consumer? Y yeah, and that's true. And and the one thing we didn't talk about, or I don't believe we did, was pri price elasticity, because one of the things we have to and the, the model, and we didn't run the model, but if we ran the model, we'd show you that. As you increase rates, people use a little bit less to offset that. So that's also taken into consideration there. So there's a little bit of that, too. So you've got people that not only uh, are benefiting because of a different rate structure, but because also of price elasticity, uh, they may be using less over time. So uh, there's, there's a number of issues in here uh, that we can demonstrate through the model, if need be. But then we'll have to increase prices to earn more revenue, right? Price elasticity would mean that if you increase the uh, the, f the rates by nine percent, you would have a a corresponding nine percent decrease in usage. It's not corresponding, but there's a decrease. It's it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, but uh, there is yes, that's what it means. Well, I mean, if you have less than that, then it's price inelastic. Is that your not definition necessarily that you're no using? no no? If uh, inelastic is a one-to-one -one, actually, but. Uh, Elasticity means that if you did a 10 percent increase, you might get a 1 percent decrease or a 2 percent decrease. And, that, and while we're not saying that those are the numbers, that's kind of the proportionality that we're looking at. Armin? Question. Uh, this may be better addressed to Walden. Have you guys ran a scenario, uh, kind of a hybrid of uh, the uh, basic business needs and the recommended needs, where uh, you take Pago out, and I think the the critical thing here, obviously, is to fulfill the reserves. And I want to know for the recommended, uh, one of the things you guys mentioned here is gradual transition to PAYGO. What percentage of this increase is attributed to PAYGO versus the reserves? Does that make sense? Yeah, let me, let me try to take that question. In terms of if the scenario was run between basic business needs and recommended, probably we've run probably 50 different scenarios plus uh, in terms of what we're recommending. Uh, in terms of whether you take PAYGO out, uh, every scenario assumes the same infrastructure improvement plan. So everything's being funded. The big difference between 
uh, the recommendations is whether the funded through the because with the bond issuance in the first three years, the bond takes care of all CIP. After, once you hit the fourth year, then it starts going into reserves, the r and reserve, and then uh, additional rate-funded capital projects. So the big question there is whether you have, you've built up your reserves quicker or slower. And so that's, that's the big difference between the two. I get that. Uh, you guys have a figure for reserves. It's 11 million. Yes. What is it for PAYGO? It's so, for example, for you to reach uh, the consumer, I guess, uh, comparison showed you get to halfway to PAYGO. Okay, what is that amount a, uh, for PAYGO? The, so, part of the PAYGO, uh, the GWP accounts for depreciation about four and a half million a year. That goes directly into the repair and rehabilitation fund. Then any capital projects get funded directly. Any PAYGO projects get funded out of that amount. So depreciation plus any additional reserves goes into the and replacement fund. There isn't a target of PAYGO uh, in terms of what PAYGO is costing. Uh, but there is a certain dollar associated with it, correct? Dollar amount. Yes. So uh, after, I think Peter mentioned, there's about an $11 million a year of capital projects that are funded through PAYGO. Okay, so it's equal, almost equal to the reserves amount. Yes, and it's continuously uh, funding. Yes. The reason I ask is because if you look at your basic business needs, uh, you have three bullets here, reserves not funded, reactive approach, reliably jeopardize. If you meet your reserves, you're kind of, you know, you can take care of the other two as well. And if that's the focus, uh, you know, uh, maybe a hybrid approach between business, the basic, and the recommended uh, may... Uh, I don't know. You guys can come up with a different scenario that may take the PAYGO component out. I don't know what that is, but I'm just, you know, I, I wanted to bring that to attention. Yeah, we could run that scenario uh, for you, but when you're looking at how much of the PAYGO is funded by rates in a one particular year, it, it varies depending on what capital improvements are coming on for that year, but on average it's anywhere between 3 to $4 million of a $50 million total uh, revenue requirement for all your expenditures. But that's typically what we saw in our model. What's funded by rates for PAYGO is a range of 3 to $4 million outside of what's funded by the reserve. So you're telling me is if, if, you be, if GWP has an extra 3 to $4 million each year, it, it can manage, it does not need to borrow in the future years for its uh, regular day-to-day? -day. Well, the, the, uh, all that PAYGO, all these uh, scenarios, is already anticipating the 2012 bond issue that is paying for roughly $50 million in capital improvement. So if we didn't have that bond issue, we would have to redo the analysis to determine how much would be funded by rates if it was all pay-go. So I couldn't say that if you generate another $3 million, does that mean now I don't have to issue bonds anymore? That would be a separate scenario to run. All right. Minor point. I hate to be accused of being wrong, but uh, my definition that I gave you of price elasticity is correct, and I suggest you go back and look at what the definition of price elasticity is. Other questions before I go to the public? Um, I have one more question. Um, I'm looking at these two charts. Um, the graph you have for uh, scenario one and four are identical. I, I don't know, it's my eyes, or I mean, they're identical. And is that from your handout? Yes. Uh, it, it, should, it should have a revision on there. Uh, the main difference that you should see between number one and number four is the lines associated with reserves. The blue one. Yeah, they're, they're identical on both mine. It's because we don't have purple showing up. I was staring at that as well. The, art, the printout doesn't have the color purple. You have to look at the slide. Uh, it was a revision that was incorporated. Oh, there's a revision. Okay, I don't. Yeah, know. and it shows up on the screen here. The oh, well, major okay. difference is that your R and R fund doesn't increase uh, in a short period of time. Thanks. Uh, does will then actually have a report that goes along with this PowerPoint? A report will be provided based on what direction is received of what, what option 
So I you, you don't you, the numbers and everything is not you don't have a report by for the numbers and what you're basing this PowerPoint on. No, we don't have a report until we know what approach we're taking, and then we'll have a report based on that rec based on the recommendation and direction of whether it's to be ideal or the recommended shown here. But shouldn't you have a report that kind of indicates all of these numbers, how you came up with these numbers and yeah. all of that? All that would be incorporated into our report, so but that would be presented at a later date. It wasn't anticipated for that to be today. It was just to go over our, our analysis and what the model outputs and recommendations would be. You have that information. You just haven't distilled it into... We just haven't put it in narrative form. Yeah. Yes, okay. correct. And uh, the past three years, the, the rate increases were 9, 14, and 12 percent? Is that correct? Nine, so about uh, 30 uh, something percent, which comes out to about 35 percent actual, 34.9 something after compounding it. Is that correct? Uh, and do we have the, fi the, the final analysis of the financial standings of the water department from last year? It's a negative $11.5 million. Okay. Uh, that's the. I'd like to get the over the actual numbers, uh, the detail of the numbers actually. See different see. than different than the budget that was submitted. Um, we don't have the budget yet, so maybe you presented it, but we don't have the document. We can, we can yet. give you the year-end uh, uh, balance sheet and income statement. Okay, or as, that'll be as of June thirtieth of two thousand eleven. Yeah. We, do we have that yet? We don't have it published, but we can we can get you the numbers. That's that's what I'm saying. I don't have that. I yeah. I don't have a budget for. Well, I can tell you. We you we have it year, and I don't have the results of operations from last year. So I, you know, um, uh, Madam Mayor, m members of the council, um, we are preparing uh, June final numbers now, uh, in preparation for the audit. They're still in draft form. Uh, the eleven and a half million was our best guess as of about a week ago where we're at. Um, so we won't have final numbers for quite a while when we get through the audit. Uh, the numbers you're going to be presenting to uh, to the to the CPA firm. Can we get those numbers before you present it to them as well, or at well, the same we're, time? We're, we're about closed okay. um, with the year. They're coming out in a week and a half, so we have to be ready with our draft uh, uh, reports for them. When will we have the actual budget for the current year? Budget or CAFR? No budget. budget for the 11, 12. Oh, year. 11, 12 budget. It should be done um, this week. Okay, because we don't have that either. Well, we have. You have it. We, we have. Don't it. have we it. don't have the book yet. Yeah, Bye. that's true. Okay. All right. And uh, this increase did nothing for our uh, bottom line. The thirty-five percent increase over the past three years. It did. In fact, if you go back to the uh, the slide that we started with in two thousand seven, and you can see what what drove it in in two thousand seven. Smart meters, you said. 2007 smart meters didn't exist. It was driven by the fact that we needed to increase infrastructure. We needed to uh, completely rebuild the uh, Chevy Chase Reservoir. We, we are now doing a major uh, pipeline replacement uh, in Dietrich. So it was driven by major infrastructure improvements. Uh, so those increases covered that. What we're now looking at is moving forward to, st to stabilize. In fact, if you recall, the chart that showed kind of that, that belly, uh, it, it's, it showed that we would still be in a very low reserve position even today, even with those reserves. Uh, we had other things occur that drove our cash position down farther from that, uh, but essentially it did what it was supposed to do. Not, not that one. The one that yeah, has that, kind of the... That doesn't idea. tell me anything that's just based on their assumptions. Uh, the 2000 and 2000, was it 2000? I'm trying to find the slide where you're showing the $11 million. Here we go. Um, the, pro the budget for or projected 2010-11 shows an $11 point million loss. And I asked, was, and it was, I asked why do we have a loss? It was at smart meters we installed start. That was only one piece of it. That was that, small, that that's was one year of the beginning balance I, I don't have. But uh, was it... Uh, when the installation of smart meters were approved, was it presented to the council, and I wasn't on council then, that we would have an $11.5 million deficit if 
that was implemented at that time? Not at that time, no, because that at that time we didn't expect 11.5 million. That's occurred over the last uh, 18 months uh, for other reasons also. Oh. Okay. Uh, that's. I'm. Um, I'm not. Something. Something's not. Uh, that's what I'd like to see all, all sure. the numbers because it's it just doesn't sound if, right. If I can clarify, um, we're kind of mixing terms here. Eleven and a half million is really referring to a deficit in the cash, not necessarily cash balance. fund balance. Okay. Financially, we, financially speaking, but we have that because we spent that money on the right. twenty well, million dollars on the smart meters, approximately. Well, the very the various capital projects. We're actually okay. in, a, in an illiquid state right now. We don't have any liquidity for cash. Financially. Um, I think the uh, last report I saw, preliminary report, we were about $3 million to the good in terms of um, adding to our equity. Okay. We're, ju we're just in an illiquid um, position right now. Can, can, can I add to that, Madam Mayor? Um, the, I don't have the page. No. On, on the slide 33, um, as I've looked at the water fund situation, what Bob's noting is that Total net income, you have a positive position and have had a positive position for quite some time, and it's projected to continue to have a positive position. Uh, about 10 percent of gross revenues uh, in net income each year. Uh, what the earlier plan in 2007 talked about was a program of undertaking a considerable amount of capital, frankly, uh, and how to finance that, both through rate increases and bond issues. And, and as Peter noted, we did part of that. We did the part that had the first bond issue and the first series of rate increases. And frankly, at that point in time, before we proceeded with the continuing capital improvements, we should have come back and said, okay, now if we're going to continue with this program of capital improvements, we need to begin to plan for subsequent rate increases and bond issue number two. And we didn't do that. Well, we should have, but we didn't do that. But we did move on with the continuing investment in the capital. And that's what's gotten us in the position. Created the, the, the deficit Essentially created a deficit position. Now, in a balance sheet, Mr. Manukin, you know, on the balance sheet, we, we moved cash into fixed assets. So that because this is an enterprise, your balance sheet will still show a very positive position. But from a cash position, we, as, as I've noted to Glenn, we got ourselves in a position of proceeding with the expenditure side, with the investment side, but not coming back and completing the, the how we were going to finance it component of that plan. And that's what we should have done. And frankly, that's what we should always do. We should never be in a position where we're coming to you after we've made the expenditures and asking you to consider a plan for how we fund it. The funding should always come before the investment component. And in my view, that's where we erred here. And that's what we need to fix over time in order to continue with the plan for improvement as well as uh, to make sure that we maintain an adequate uh, rating for our, for our water fund on a going forward basis. Any other questions right now? We will come back and have another opportunity for questions after the public speaks. Uh, first speaker, Harry Zavos, followed by Aram Kazazian. And just so the public knows, this is not the last time we're going to be discussing this, so there will be another opportunity to, to speak in the future. Uh, House of Commissioners, my name is Harry Zavos, and I'm principally concerned about compliance with the substantive provisions of Proposition 218, and uh, because I haven't had a chance to ask questions about the charts with that disclaimer, let me indicate what my concerns are. It seems to me that the idea of the rate structure tries to address three goals as it was presented. To force conservation, to take into consideration the needs of the various rate payers, that's why we have classes, and then also to uh, take into consideration Costs, and that's why we have tiered within residential, five tiers for single family, three tiers for multifamily. Uh, my problem is that the substantive provisions of Proposition 218 say that there's only one consideration to be made in terms of rate. And I will quote you, it says, the amount of the fee or charge imposed upon any parcel or person as an incident of uh, property ownership shall not exceed the proportional cost of the service attributed to the parcel. That's the guiding principle that the Constitution imposes on these fees. Now, when the tiered structure, and I don't understand why the cost to commercial would be different than the cost of providing water to residential. 
Also, I have no understanding as to why we have two tiers. I can understand based on the presentation why we have two, uh, uh, why we have five tiers. I can understand why we have two tiers because the presentation said the cost attributable to groundwater is much less than cost attributable to water we get from the Metropolitan Water District. If that's the case, we ought to allow to each rate payer, each account, an allotment which represents their share of the groundwater divided by the number of accounts. And then they have one rate for that. Then when they started exceeding that allotment, which then would represent uh, water from the Metropolitan District, we have a uh, additional rate. But I don't understand the basis for a five-tiered system. Now, there was an explanation of the three-tiered three system. Uh, for multifamily, as I understood, the super efficient uses only groundwater. The tier two uses groundwater plus metropolitan water, and the third tier uses metropolitan water only. Well, that's un not understandable to me. No rate payer is going to be charged for only metropolitan water. Every rate payer should equally have an equal division of the water available at from groundwater and the rates for that water, and then everybody who goes above that should be an additional amount because that represents the cost of metropolitan water. Unless I've misunderstood, I'd like that clarified. It brings up a second uh, question that I have. Um, if anybody has any additional questions, if they email them to either me or Mr. Steiger, I'll have them answered. Um, Aram, Aram Kazazian? You can email it to me as well, just for the record. Good afternoon. My name is Aram Kazazian. Have you seen the, this uh, right now on the internet? It says this poverty rate hit 18 years high. The poverty rate in the United States right now stands at 46.2 million people are in poverty, and that's 15.1 percent of them are in poverty. People don't have money to pay all these expenses you guys have been imposing. And few of you are responsible for this. We borrowed $110 million to do the structure, repair the structure on this water. And where is that money? What happened to it? So we dumped in with smart meters. Then we go through, we're going to, uh, we'll, I want to know what happened. Uh, we have an increase of 9, 9%, 14%, and 12%. That's 35%. If you compound that, it comes to 38%. Then we have another 15.01% was done last year, not 3.8%. 3.8% was only the first year. On apartment commercials were, did not even affect them. They went to the 15.01%. You people keep saying 3.8. It's not 3.8%. That everybody understand and know that it's 15.01. And I have that in writing from the Water Department. I'll be more than glad to provide you. Uh, now, the 110 million was through a document uh, uh, received, uh, asked for city clerk's office. That's where it came. We, we want to put in another $120 million bond. We're going to kill this city. If you look at that chart, if you look at this chart over here, everybody study it. Look at the green, where the green says, you know, how much our interest costs, how much our bond cost is. It's five times more than the last 10 years. We're spending all this money. We keep borrowing, 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 instead of balancing our budget, see what we can do instead of borrowing. That's where you're losing money right there. Nobody has any financial, you know, interest in the city. I guess they don't. You know, only very few of you, you know, uh, is interested in financial. We have three minutes to talk about. We can't even talk about many things. Uh, so th th that's one thing you need to look. Uh, the five percent increase every year is that on the first tier, like the three point eight percent, or what? It's on the second tier. It's hidden costs. What nobody knows is that a 20% increase, 30%, 40% increase on the second tier. Nobody's saying a word about it. We, haven't, we don't have any staff report that specifies. I haven't seen it. I've been looking for it. I can't find it. Or is there going to be a surprise to you and to us? I'll take this Wilden report and I'll put it in a trash can. That's as good as I can, I, I can tell you that Wilden report is after studying it. It's a piece of garbage, I think. I think we should. We need to have an audit. See where all this money is going. Thank you. Thank you, Barry Allen. Did you come back in the room? Did you want to speak? Let's see here. Thank you, Madam 
Mayor. And here's somebody's, well, I guess this is. Thank you, I'm Barry Allen. Uh, a cursory review of the PowerPoint leads to some serious questions. The GWP is asking for $120 million in bonds to be issued, yet they have not indicated the real cost of the ratepayer. The usual formula is double the face to get the total cost. Does that mean $240 million will have to be paid out of ratepayer fees? The fact that the GWP still transfers 20 to $24 million a year uh, to the general fund could alleviate the need for the, uh, for the bonds if that money was used to build the reserve and not transferred each year. The Council has chosen in the past to do away with infrastructure maintenance by spending that money on the general fund rather than live within the means, pay as you go, of the resources available. It's never too late to start being prudent. Uh, in the report, there's no mention of people expenses, reduction of expenses, a hiring freeze, or the actual cost of the water. Uh, there's no definition of pay-go, which now I understand because of Councilmember Manugian, it means pay-as-you-go on the uh, capital improvements, but nor the necessary uh, requisites for a public vote to comply with Prop 218. How much will the city pay to convince voters that Prop 218 is not in their best interest, as the city did with the UUT? Um, I'm also curious about the test water wells at Rockhaven. There's no reference to them that I've seen in the report. Does that mean the wells are dry holes? If not, the DWP, GWP could buy Rockhaven if it's producing uh, uh, water producing wells. The comparison charts such as on page 37 only show rate increases. There's no baseline established showing the starting or ending point. And one of my associates did a quick run through uh, and he said, uh, even then, I got stalled and left it pretty soon after the statistical start, charts started appearing and the presentation got complex. For what it's worth, I think if I were you, my main concern and goal would be to establish thorough proof of credibility or lack thereof. Uh, put another way, I would demand clear ex uh, exposition of proof as to uh, whether or not the costs upon which the analysis of base are padded. Otherwise, you might simply have here a, a, a polished presentation that amounts to a little more than garbage in, garbage out. Padding, hidden of course, is de rigueur in commercial arrangements, particularly with government as customers. Stakeholders' uh, demand require increased profits, and their apparatchiks uh, have more than a tendency and response to set out to achieve that by fair means or foul, including stealth if necessary. Uh, I think that we really need to take a serious look at that. And uh, one of the things I heard earlier had to do with uh, rate increases. Uh, if we're having to pump the water north, maybe those people should pay more because the electricity comes. Thank you. I'm Barry Allen. Thank you. I think Al Hoffman's left. That's my last card. I'll go back now to the Commission and the Council for any other comments or questions. Are we going to have to give direction? Staff looking, you're looking for yeah, staff is, I it was this just informational or are you looking for direction at this time? We're looking, we're looking for direction at this time, yes. Sit down. And by the way, I just want to add, if there, we, we can show the model and we can change the model in real time if need be uh, to answer some of the questions that you've had. Thank you. Um, term credibility was brought up. Credibility of the speakers against the credibility of Will Dan. I've known Will Dan for decades, and I'll rest my credibility with them. Speakers. Just in general, uh, we read all the time about the infrastructure of this country of ours falling apart, whether it's highways, bridges, dams, you name it. Why? Because it's been politically expedient over the years not to fund the needs that this country has needed in terms of infrastructure. Continue infighting by politicians, people afraid to clamp down and do what is right is allowing the infrastructure to decay. I will never go there. I think I understand the recommendations here. I want to be assured that our reserves in every sector of this city are adequate. And that the, uh, the capital improvement is at such a level that we can continue to upgrade 
parts of our system that are probably dating back to the 30s and 40s. Can't necessarily wait till it fails. What do you think is going to happen to this city when there is a major earthquake and it is going to come? It could be a seven, it could be an eight. We're going to have infrastructure problems throughout the city, whether they be visible above ground or below ground. If we don't have adequate reserves built up in every category, there's going to be a lot of residents of this community without, who knows, weeks, months. You don't rebuild underground systems in a few weeks. Get bridges and stuff back in action a little quicker. Hot storm drains and sewers, water supply. What does a human being need the most? They need water. Males, we're in trouble. So, I say, well, it's too much of in the public. As I said, it may not be the politically expedient thing to do, to vote no, but I wasn't brought up here to do that. I was brought up here to set fiscal responsibility for the city. That means adequate reserves and operating revenue. So, I'm perfectly fine in supporting the recommendation. Water and power on the staff and will down. Let's move to the next stage and get the additional information we might need to act on it. Thank you. You want to know which scenario? <clears throat> Any comments that you have, which scenario you prefer, um, questions you have, observations, more corrections about people's terminology, anything you It's fine. I'd like to hear from the commissioners, actually. Madam Mayor, if I can. I'd, I'd like their advice. In the end, we do need to have some direction on how to proceed with the 218 notification if we're going to do a 218 notification. Okay. So, and that will require one of the scenarios. I said recommend it, so I'm on. Do any of the commissioners? Um, yes, I would like to uh, make a couple of comments. Um, thank you so much for the informative presentations. I um, really understand uh, about the situation at uh, Glendale Water and Power. It's not a sustainable model. Um, we're way in the negatives and the reserves, and our infrastructure is really too old. And just as Councilman Weaver indicated, uh, we desperately need to upgrade our infrastructure. And as far as um, the uh, recommendations go, I agree with the recommended uh, scenario. I've interacted with many customers throughout my career, residential and commercial, and every single one of them has indicated to me that they prefer a smaller increase every year rather than a big one one year and then stop for a couple of years and then another huge one. Um, even though the ideal recommendation starts with a nine and, and you know, it, it's really an ideal situation for the uh, uh, utility, however, it's not really um, as good a, a scenario for our rate payers. So I highly recommend um, um, scenario one and I agree to move forward with Prop uh, Proposition 218. I'd like to uh, echo um, Commissioner Chan's um, comments, but also uh, state that I think that uh, in this economy, uh, we have to be particularly sensitive uh, to um, customers. And I'd like to refer to them as customers, not just as rate payers. Um, that customers are going to have to um, absorb this. But I think one thing we have to also realize um, uh, in the last couple of months, I took a tour um, thanks to uh, Mayor Friedman's um, invitation of the Colorado Aqueduct System. And I have to say that was very, very educational. And to me, it kind of emphasized the point of how much we have come to disregard or not think about how it is that the water that gets to the um, to our area, what it takes to get it there. And I think that there's a cost associated with that, which I think as, uh, as a member of the public, um, e I, even I who takes the time to study these things was not aware of how complicated it is and how costly it is. And I think that um, if the recommended approach gets us closer to a more accurate pricing of this uh, uh, finite resource called water, then I am uh, in favor of that. I'm also in favor of us getting to the point of redesign so that those who are consuming water, um, the people who use less are rewarded and the people who use more uh, pay a price for that. 
And that's the point at which we get to the appropriate balancing of the behavior and the understanding of the value of this resource. Um, I'd also like to caution that um, I am dismayed when I hear smart meters used as the albatross that we wrap around and look at that as the cause of the deficit. That is not the cause. I'm actually, as a resident, proud that our city is forward-thinking enough to invest in that technology, which I think will ultimately uh, lead to better two-way engagement with customers so that they can understand their usage patterns more, and that education level will, and that information, availability of that real-time information is going to lead to the behavior uh, changes and the choices that customers will um, be able to make as informed customers. And so that becomes very apparent, both on the electric side and on the water side, what it takes um, to use these um, um, resources. I'll end with one comment. In the last two weeks, I personally uh, made an advanced um, investment in my own home. I didn't have any problems, but I ended up changing the pipe that leads from my water meter to my house because my plumber, when he was digging for something else, pointed out to me how corroded the old pipe was. And when he took that pipe out, which cost me a couple thousand dollars to do, uh, he showed me what the inside of that pipe look, looked like. And it was uh, horrifying to see what was inside that pipe, very similar to the pictures that you showed in this presentation. And so that sort of investment I made personally to get ahead of it so that in the future I won't have problems and, as opposed to running to fail taking advantage of the situation, I decided to make that investment. I think as a city and as customers, we also have to make the necessary um, investments, as you saw in the presentation. It, um, much of our infrastructure is pre-1940s, and it's catching up to us at this point. So I think we need to uh, make that sort of investment, but to the extent that we can spread it out over time so that it impacts people less and that people that are using the resource more pay more of a share of that, um, I'm all for that sort of calibration, which will, I think will lead to better conservation, long-term conservation in the future without having to uh, impose laws. It's conservation by economics versus conservation by um, laws that penalize people. Thank you. One of the things that I would like to see actually is uh, really another scenario that um, as I was asking questions before about the PAYGO, I would like to see how if that component is taken out of the equation, how that impacts uh, the recommended or the basic uh, uh, scenarios. Also, um, the 5% five, 5% 5 increase obviously, the recommended rate, that's the average increase per customer, but obviously the actual uh, bill or the the the, the actual uh, bill that the actual customer will pay on each uh, spectrum will be very different. So I would like to see that range actually on the low side and the high side. What is that impact for the you know uh, what is that spectrum like all the way across? We're seeing over here that picture is very different here and over there on the low side and the high side. Um, my uh, two cents says that um, over the next couple of years, everything is so volatile. You know, next, over the next two years, a lot of things are changing. Make major decisions today over the next two years, I don't know if that's the best uh, way to go about it. Um, uh, my, you know, I'm, I'm leaning more towards the basic needs model, uh, the basic business needs with the, with the importance, with putting an impact on getting the, reserve, the reserves up to date first. I mean, you have to get the reserves up to date, and that should be the focus. Uh, I don't know if PAYGO is, is something should, that should be considered right now. So my recommendation would be to look at a, another scenario, see what that is, and to have an, the lowest amount of impact on uh, customers over the next couple of years. Uh, thank you. I uh, have a few comments. Uh, I'm the newest commissioner, so I'll speak uh, probably most briefly. I still have a lot to learn, but I had a lot of years of experience in uh, water, uh, including uh, rate setting by Metropolitan Water District when I had the um, privilege of serving there for a few years on its board. So I'm not entirely unfamiliar with um, the relationship between um, uh, conservation and uh, and revenue. Also not entirely unfamiliar with the um, pros and cons of financing longer-term projects through bonds. 
I'm, uh, I'll just uh, say a couple of things. I'm not uh, a big fan of uh, putting all of our eggs currently in this idea of pay-as-you-go, although that has a great ring to it, and I think we as, uh, uh, as prudent um, stewards of the public's funds uh, as, a, as a fundamental um, uh, fiscal policy, we should always um, expect or hope that we can pay for things as we're going along, but when you're in such a hole as we are in now, that's not realistic. I personally, my philosophy personally right now, given the state of our economy and the, um, uh, the, the hole that we're in, uh, would be to favor um, uh, pursuing capital improvements through a, a bond and using the bond in an aggressive way to um, replace our um, um, uh, our infrastructure, no, not our infrastructure, our reserves, um, and to, and to uh, most fairly spread the cost of uh, capital improvements uh, across to the generations who will be using those improvements in the future. I think that um, that prudent use of bond measures is called for. Um, it's clear to me that we have an unsustainable rate structure for water here in Glendale. We are undercharging for our water, and we have um, not done the things that prudent cities uh, surrounding us have done to um, be able to provide for basic, basic maintenance and to protect our water quality. So I do agree that uh, we're in a, a, this is a time that calls for prudent action. That said, times are very tough for our citizens. We've got a very high rate of poverty, children and families living in poverty in Glendale, people thrown out of work, development at a standstill. Um, I think it's going to be a very hard sell indeed to ask uh, customers to pay uh, the rates that have been recommended. And so if we do move towards the adoption of the recommendations that we heard today, um, I would like to see the narrative reports and future meetings with City Council and with the Commission be very sensitively um, written up and presented uh, so that the public and commissioners and council um, have the highest possible um, confidence in the numbers and um, that some of the comments that we heard today from members of the public, including some by Mr. Zavos, uh, questioning the logic of the tier structure. Um, I, I have to say, uh, I, I too would like to see um, more attention paid to that in the report um, so that pu the public, the commissioners, and the council can understand some of the um, recommendations and so that the public feels that we've done our job in, in um, questioning the analysis. And um, I think every aspect of the analysis should be able to be um, explained to members of the public so that they have clarity. I'm not in favor of jargon like PAYGO. Um, I think Mr. Zavos had a good point when he said that there's a certain um, um, smoke and mirrors quality to the um, slide that um, uh, that tries to indicate that some people will be using more groundwater and less MWD water. That that, that we, there's no need for for um, um, obfuscation on PowerPoint slides, and the report should, I think, address Mr. Zavos's points because I think they were good ones. I would also like to say that uh, I too question the disparate treatment of businesses and residential consumers. Um, I think our rate structure should. Um, not appear to disincentivize conservation by businesses. And um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that in the report. I wasn't entirely clear in my own mind 
uh, about the treatment of businesses um, versus residential rate payers. So I think that's an area that the report could, um, where the report could be strengthened. And again, with an eye towards um, making sure that uh, before we ask rate payers in this very difficult economic climate to um, come up with um, more money immediately out of their pockets, uh, and we're trying to find the right balance between the pay-as-you-go approach and the bond measure approach. I think there's room for improvement in the, um, the narrative report. So I would be looking forward to receiving more information on those um, aspects. Thank you. Mr. Quintero? I basically agree with Ms. Uh, Dentler and Mr. Jamian, who happens to be my appointee. Uh, let me start by uh, thanking Mr. Steiger for the good work that he's done since he's uh, taken over the helm of GWP. It's only been about three years, three to four years, but I think he's put the uh, department on the right uh, track and headed in the right direction. Now, my question is, where in the world has GWP been all of these years? They're showing us charts dating back to the 1920s, and most of the infrastructure was done in the 1920s. Where was GWP when the times were good, during the boom in the economic cycle that we had, 2000, 2001, 2004? It's like all of a sudden, in the past few years, they've discovered that we have these problems. I find that very strange. I find it very strange. It makes no sense to me when we're flush with money that GWP had very few requests. Now the times are tough. It seems to be the exact opposite. If we don't do it tomorrow, we're going to be in serious uh, trouble. I'm not a professional engineer. I'm not a, a water person, so I have to rely on the staff. But my gut tells me something's wrong. Something's drastically wrong that we can go from a situation where in the past 10 to 12 years it was barely mentioned in terms of infrastructure, and now all of a sudden we're, we're on the verge of collapse. Um, so that's my first uh, uh, comment. Now, what I've been asking for for many years, and what I never see from GWP, is a cost-cutting plan whether it has to do with labor or contracting, but there's never a cost-cutting plan in this department, which kind of reminds me maybe of the Department of Defense, where every Air Force general feels that this project has to be completed or the nation's in uh, jeopardy. Of course, the Navy feels the same way, and the Marine Corps don't touch our uh, forces. So I think it's time for GWP to do something other than to come to that podium and to make it seem like you're coming to an end. The world's coming to an end if we don't start the capital improvement uh, projects. I just don't buy it, quite frankly. I'm for a rate redesign. I think this is something that we should have done long ago. And I'm very happy that we seem to have the uh, bones to kind of begin the, uh, the process. So I'm for the rate redesign. In terms of raising rates, I think I've voted for the past uh, two times. I think I voted against both uh, rate increases. This time, given enough material and enough information, I'm not prepared to do it uh, tonight. I don't like the idea that we had absolutely no time to digest all of this information, and then we're being asked uh, to go ahead and make a decision. I think we need to spend more time. Ms. Manukian had some good questions. Uh, so does Armin, so does Deborah, and I'm sure others do, too. I think there are more questions that need to be uh, answered. But it seems to me if I were to go for a, uh, a increase, it would be very limited. And my proposal, given the right information, I would consider perhaps a 2% increase for a maximum of three years. And hopefully in the next uh, uh, three years, hopefully the economy will stabilize and will be headed in the right direction and we'll be better able to make some uh, to make some decisions, um, but that's, uh, that's the way I feel. I just get very irritated when we get these presentations, and that was similar to what happened to Chevy Chase. The reservoir all of a sudden 
was catastrophic, an earthquake. The earthquake had taken place years and years before, but it just so happened at that particular time it, was, it had to uh, be done. So for tonight, I'm not prepared to, uh, to give any direction. I'd like to have some more information. Okay. Um, and um, because you raised some very legitimate concerns, I will give Mr. Steiger, if he wants, an opportunity to answer some of those questions and concerns in terms of are we in a constant state of emergency only when we need money? What's GW, where has GWP been all my life? All those sorts of questions. <laughs> I will address the issue of, you know, where was GWP? Um, clearly, uh, there wasn't as much emphasis on rebuilding infrastructure for a very, very long time at GWP. That was true on both sides, by the way. And that was true on the electric side, too. And over the last six, seven years, uh, prior to my getting here, there has been more, much more of a concentration and an effort to put resources into the rebuilding of the infrastructure for both electric and water. And you're seeing some of the, the, uh, the results of that today. Uh, but we're not finished by any means. So yes, there, there, was, uh, there was some, uh, and I, I won't go as far as to say neglect, but there certainly wasn't a focus on doing that for a long, long time. There is today. Uh, and now if you go back to where we started uh, by using the 2007 presentation, that was really uh, the call to arms basically to say, okay, we've got some major work to do here. We've started it, but we have a long way to go. And this is what it's going to take to get there. So there is some truth to the fact that, yeah, uh, it could have been recognized many, many years ago. For whatever reason, it wasn't as recognized as it maybe should have been. But we've certainly recognized it now. Uh, I, I won't say that, you know, if, if we don't do anything, uh, we're just going to close up shop. But I am going to say that we, uh, that GWP came before this group in 2007 and said, we have an issue, we have to do these improvements. What we're saying is, we're not finished. We still have to do that. There have been some changes in the meantime. The economy's changed. We all know what's gone on. Uh, and some of the other things we talked about. But we need to continue. So that's really what the issue is. Thank you. And isn't it true also, Mr. Steiger, that um, when the department defers maintenance, maintenance and is only getting around to visiting our fire hydrants one-third of the time that's uh, um, considered prudent, uh, and some of the other things that we saw in the presentation, when Mr. Kavunas tells us that we're way below it's seemingly national standards for how to protect our water quality, how to protect our infrastructure because we're doing so much deferred maintenance. I hear that as GWP doing its doing some cost cutting. We, that isn't that how you are. Oh, that's how you keep coming back year after year, saying that you're holding a line on costs. It's you're actually asking the public to put up with a weakened infrastructure. That's correct, and we didn't come uh, prepared today as we may have, sh may should have, uh, on the issue of cost cutting. But we've done a significant amount of cost cutting, again, for both utilities over the last few years based on the fact that we've had to cut the budget back. Our, our past budget presentations have, have indicated that. that. That's a prime example of what we've done. We've had to cut out contractors that normally do that kind of work. Uh, we've eliminated overtime. Uh, we've done, done a number of things uh, short of massive layoffs, quite frankly, uh, to cut costs. So, but we are to the point, quite, quite honestly now, we are to the point where we've pretty much cut back as much as we can without impacting the labor force. So that's where we are, but we, we have done that, yes. The labor force that you said was 10 percent of the department's budget? The, the, labor, uh, the, the labor costs are about 10 percent of our entire budget, yeah. That's correct. Mr. Minukian? I'll, I'll be the rebel out here. Uh, I'm not going to vote for any rate increases. We just increased uh, the B-line rates 200%. Uh, we had a whole number of increases before then with the zoning zoning changes. Uh, and uh, I just feel that these increases, uh, and we keep hearing errors being made by staff, by management, uh, planning earlier, same thing. Uh, and I don't know, I didn't, I didn't get enough numbers today in terms of detail to really make a determination uh, as to uh, the necessity of rate increases, I'll put it that way. I just, uh, I just feel very uncomfortable, very uh, uncomfortable with the numbers, basically, uh, of what I'm getting at this point. 
and uh, I just think that these rate increases will affect those who are in need in the worst time economically uh, ever, in, in my recollection. I just don't agree with it in principle, and uh, I'd like to see more detail and see where we go from there. Um, at this point, I'm not willing to go anywhere with this. Uh, I'd like to see more detail in terms of the numbers, in terms of the financials for the city. I'd like to see where we are last two months for the city as well. Not just the budget, but uh, the financials and the performance of the city. I'd, look, I'd like to get more input from um, other expert as it other experts as it relates to some of these numbers. So I'm I'm not prepared to do anything at this point regarding rate increases. So, Mr. Jerry. Okay. Well, I mean, when we talk about rate increases, what we're really talking about are the impact on the customer, the amount that that person has to pay in his bill, his bi-monthly bill or his monthly bill, and. You know, I've heard from Mr. Mnookin, and oh, he's concerned about the rate. And I've heard about Mr. Quintero, oh, he's concerned about the rate. May I, go, may I have slide 19, please? But the... You guys know where I'm going. What we have here is the single-family consumption pattern. And why are we getting the spikes? in June, July, August, and September. We're getting the spikes not because we're taking more showers, not because we're drinking more water. We're getting those spikes because we're irrigating our front lawns. And I'm very upset that, the, that there was, a, in my view, a manipulation of the agenda item on the discussion of artificial turf to be several weeks before this very difficult discussion that we have. Now, Mr. Manukian, Mr. Quintero, if you're concerned about what the rate payer actually has to pay out of his pocket every week, then how on earth could you ignore that consumption pattern and vote against artificial turf? Because whatever increase that we put in the rates is a minutia compared to the amount of water, the hundreds and hundreds of gallons of water, thousands of gallons of water that we pour on our front lawns to maintain it in the way that the city requires us to maintain it. So a 5%, whether it's a 2%, whether it's an 8% increase, it is nothing compared to the amount of water that our customers could save if we let them put in artificial turf, and not just the single-family residential customers, but also the customers that live in the multifamily because they have to irrigate their front lawns also. 50 gallons per month, 50 gallons per year on a one square foot patch of grass. So where is the consistency in the concern for the rate payers? I want the artificial turf brought back. Because if we're going to talk about rates, and you guys are going to complain about rates, and what the average person has to pay out of his pocket, well, right there, let's eliminate those peaks. And those peaks are due to the irrigation of our front lawns. No other reason. We're not taking three times as, as long showers in the summer. We're not taking three times as many showers. We're not drinking three times as much water that's going to make that impact. So I'm very unhappy. I'm sorry? I heard a comment there. So I want the artificial turf back because this should be part of this whole water discussion. It's a critical part. The increase in consumption that is going to be, uh, that these rates are going to have the effect on is, can be totally mitigated by having artificial turf in our front lawns. So I just want everyone to know that, that I'm not happy the way this, the process of this discussion of artificial turf two weeks ago, three weeks ago, a distant memory is now, uh, has faded away, and the real impact that my colleagues have indicated, they're concerned about your rates, ladies and gentlemen, but they're not going to vote for artificial turf to be put in the front lawn. So let's talk about that discrepancy and, and uh, cognitive dissonance on how this can be explained away. I'm sure they'll have explanations, but their bottom line from both of them is that they don't want you to pay higher rates. Just, they just don't for want the record, the, the mayor voted against it, too. You don't want to mention that. She hasn't her? spoken yet, though. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. I just thought you were discriminating. No, I'm not discriminating, but... I mean, it really is a concern, and I think it's a solution to some of the problems that we have for the individual that can't afford that 9%. Um, imagine Mr. Kazajian, who's a constant uh, 
critic of our rate structure and how much his homeowner's organization has to pay. Imagine what would happen if they were permitted to put artificial turf in the front. Their usage would go down dramatically. So let's include that in the entire discussion here. I think Mr. Zavos's point about giving everyone an allocation of the groundwater up to a certain level and then at that point have higher rates, it's part of the, the tiered system. Uh, that would be possible through our smart meters where we could have precise monitoring of the amount that's being used and then perhaps have a flashing icon on your screen saying you are now in overtime, you know, you're paying the extra rates. Uh, Mr. Allen's discussion about the cost of delivery, um, the water isn't directly pumped into the homes up on the highest hillsides, but it's pumped into reservoirs sufficiently high, 1,000 feet high, 1,200 feet high, to provide those homes. If there is an additional cost that can be uh, allocated to those homes that require that extra energy, electricity, to pump the water up there, um, I'm not sure if there's a model that uh, distinguishes between those that have low water delivery charges on an individual basis versus those that have high water, water delivery charges. I'd be interested in looking at that. But all that aside, as we're getting late, I don't want to, I want to save some of my fire for this evening's meeting. Um, I would support the recommended uh, scenario. Uh, just to get us on track, to get our reserves back. Uh, but I will, not, I will not consider any increase unless the artificial turf and the opportunity for residents who wish to save water by using uh, non-irrigated landscaping on the front lawn of their homes are given an opportunity to do so. Mr. Garcia, can he hold that hostage by saying that unless we vote his way on a past issue, he won't support something that he would otherwise support? In, because it's a legislative act, approval of the, of the water rates, he can choose many reasons why not to, why, uh, not to vote for something or why to vote for something. Um, as far as the actual artificial turf, um, I would uh, remind the council that that action was voted on and actually come back, it would require somebody who voted um, to not approve our, the changes in our official turf, it requires somebody uh, that was on that side to ask that that come back. We have two requests to speak, Mr. Manuki, and followed by Mr. Quintero. <laughs> it's nice to be theatrical sometimes, and it's certainly uh, entertaining. I'm not being theatrical. No, yeah, no, you are. I, yeah, you no, are. It's my turn to speak, no, and you but can, I can It's my to turn. No, you respond when like your that. turn comes up. No, it's you, a I, I was quiet I when you were speaking. No, you be quiet while I'm speaking. Okay. If a colleague of mine is going to refer to my comments as theatrical, I would expect you to reprimand him and to direct his comments to the issue at hand, not the man. I in will. Which I, I will. I will give you an opportunity to speak. I will speak. address the issue at hand. It seems you disregard the issue that was brought up earlier in terms of staff and the city council spending money that you didn't have on smart meters, and that was stated earlier by uh, by the city manager. Second, look at that. Look at that chart. What does that chart tell you? You misrepresented that chart. Yes, in the beginning, 2005, June, June, July, August, it's high. However, what is it in 2010? Is it high again? No, it's not. It's lower. You, give, you don't give enough credit to this community. When you, as council, requested from the community to conserve water, what did they do? They conserved water. And that is not in the, indicated in this report. And that's what we should take into consideration, not some artificial turf uh, issue. That's not the issue. The issue is conserving water and redesigning your front yard could certainly go a long way in saving your, uh, saving your uh, reserves for the city council, for the, for the community and the water rates, not you know, holding something hostage and, and criticizing your colleagues for voting a certain way, just because it's not your way. Mr. Quintero. As I have said many, many times, I will repeat once again, no one is requiring residents of the city of Glendale to maintain a, quote, green lawn and to use all of the artificial uh, uh, fertilizers and so forth that uh, Ms. Najarian has referred to. In fact, for many years here and throughout uh, the nation, as far as I know, at least in the West, uh, 
We're encouraging conservation, using drought-tolerant plants. There are just so many ways to go. There's so many different things you can do other than to have a, uh, a lawn that you're constantly pouring uh, water on. And artificial turf is not the answer. Okay, let me make my comments, if there, unless there's any other comments at the moment. And I will give you an opportunity again to speak, if you so desire. Um, I agree with a lot that's been said here. I won't belittle it. Um, Mr. Armenian, Ms. Dentler, Mr. Weaver pretty much summed up what I wanted to say. I mean, look, in terms of doing a lower, let me, let me say a few things. Um, first of all, let's keep in mind that the price that we're paying for the majority of the water that we drink is going up. I believe MED is raising the price of water 7% this year. Am I right, Peter? 7.5% this year, 7.5% next year. And there's a lot of indication it's going to go up a lot higher than that afterwards because kind of like the city of Glendale, Metropolitan, believe it or not, is running at a deficit and not covering their cost to deliver water. So if we only raise our rates 2%, we're not paying for the water that we're importing. So where does that money come from? It means going further and further into deficit or, or forestalling capital projects that I think everybody agrees are extremely important. I mean, the world may not end, but we could end up with water breaks that cost us a lot more money than it would cost us to fix those issues now. So I think that fiscal responsibility says that we have to do some version of this. I am also a little concerned about PAYGO, which is why I asked some of the questions earlier. I would like to see, the next time this comes back, a little more discussion of PAYGO and how it relates to reserves, and also whether it's um, beneficial to have a percentage of PAYGO target that we work towards. To me, 100 percent PAYGO doesn't make sense as policy, practically. Um, in terms of fairness, the con you had cons for 100 percent PAYGO, and I think that we would need a further discussion of those before we have 100 percent PAYGO as our goal. I think that there are a lot of times where PAYGO is very appropriate, and I wouldn't want to see us have no PAYGO, but I'd like to see a percentage that we are moving towards and where we would achieve that percentage with the various scenarios that have been proposed. Uh, I support the recommended alternative. I think it's prudent, but it's not over the top. Um, to me, the business, somebody mentioned the business versus residential. I do understand the rationale for having a flat commercial rate because it seems to me that we know that residential can, through conservation, hit our target. Um, that's been proven. Um, that's not an issue. But for businesses, that's not the case. If, if you have a car wash, you may, and I don't know, I could be wrong about car washes, but I'm assuming that if you have a car wash, even if you have the most efficient car wash in the country, you're still going to use a lot more water than certain other businesses. So to penalize that person strictly because of the type of business they're in doesn't make sense to me. Um, so I think having a flat commercial rate and then allowing con still promoting conservation through the incentives we have. And we have very strong incentives for commercial conservation. I believe on the, I know we have it on the power side. I assume we have it on water side for upgrades. We have incentives for building, you know, green building that includes water um, savings. Uh, and just reducing your water usage for any business and saving money is a motivation for conservation as well. So I do agree with having the separate um, sort of standard for business and residential. I would like to look into, and it doesn't have to be the next time it comes back, but at some point, tiers for irrigation, because it seems to me that just as private resident, single family residences can reduce water usage by not having lawn, by having a beautiful drought resistant garden, uh, irrigation can find the same sort of efficiencies through different type of irrigation systems. Um, so I would like to see whether there's some rationale for, irrig for a tiered rate with irrigation. I don't know how much the irrigation is of our water sales, um, but that's something I'd be interested in at some point. Um, because labor was brought up, I just want to mention, just as an aside, that I've been comparing what our labor, what their deal is and sort of what their package is compared to other agencies, um, mostly because I'm on the board of Metropolitan Water District and we're going through uh, very painful labor negotiations. And I can tell you that there is absolutely no comparison. I mean, at Metropolitan, the employees pay nothing towards their CalPERS contribution, whereas here I believe they're at 10 percent at this point. Right, they play the full employee share plus a portion of the employer's share. At Metropolitan, they vest after five years in full medical for the rest of their lives. We pay no medical benefits after retirement, although you can stay in the group. 
the employees are all laughing and they're going to go fill out their applications. They have a hiring freeze, so don't even try. But, um, you know, while I'm not going to say that we have nowhere to go in terms of labor in Glendale, I think that we've been very conservative in our labor negotiations, and I don't think that there's a huge amount of savings in the water utility in terms of labor, in terms of sort of renegotiations for us. Um, I would like to see at some point pulled out what our what the budget is going to be for water incentive, water saving incentives for residential and commercial users. I want to be sure that as we do cost cutting, that we try to maintain as much of that as we can. And one thing I hear a lot from people is, you know, can I get the kind of cash for grass incentive that they have in other areas? I know that we've chosen to put our money in other places, but this is something I, I support very much, providing financial incentives for people to be able to save water. So I hope that as we continue budgeting, that that's something that we do um, continue to allocate funds for. Um, so in any case, uh, that's my bottom line. I support the recommended. Uh, I would like to hear the information that other uh, commissioners and council members have asked to come back. Mr. Manukian? I have a question. Uh, you said uh, MWD would increase the water rates by 7 percent approximately? This year. Uh, seven and a half. And uh, what, what we didn't see was uh, what would happen if the community conserved 10 percent this year, then how would that affect into the rate and uh, our costs of running the water utility? You're correct. We, we didn't model additional conservation. We believe that at this point in time, <coughs> after two years of mandatory conservation that has just been lifted, we believe that residents will, will continue to observe the level of conservation and will slightly increase, but maybe 5 percent from where they were last year. Uh, we don't see the, the drive for people to go. But that's not, that wasn't my question. My question was well, if, the, if there was a conservation and decrease, would that, uh, would that save us from uh, the costs? Would that save us enough where we wouldn't, we wouldn't have to increase the costs to the residents? I understand your that's, question. That's the question. I understand it now. And, uh, you know, we'd have to run the model. You know, okay. not selling. I'd, as I'd much like water. to see things of that sort, actually. So, somebody else. I just had one more um, comment to add, and that is that you know, one of the uh, two things actually. I think that if we could, uh, if we achieve that much conservation just through voluntary participation. Um, as well as obviously an ordinance, um, but it was mostly volunteer, uh, that I think an economic incentive to continue it might actually continue to achieve in flattening those uh, peaks. Um, because I do think that the, that the big, the big uh, thing to go after is the landscaping where most of the water is going with the number of single-family homes we have in this community. But the second thing, which is the elephant in the room, is that you know for years, both on the electric side and on the water side, We've been transferring uh, money from the utility to the general fund to pay for other things that are uh, uh, necessary as well, perhaps. And I, you know, I don't envy any city council that has to make these choices, particularly in down years where you have to choose between things. And at the end of the day, the money has to come from somewhere. But the reality is, is that when we choose to use the utility as a way to raise funds uh, from the community, and if that uh, combined with a down economy and other factors such as the conservation, which has driven some of the lower revenue, has created a, a perfect storm of where you've started to uh, siphon away money from the infrastructure projects. And so at some point you have to make some choices. At this point, I think that the, the, this sort of increase is going to hopefully correct the issue. But the reality is, and I know that the water transfers have stopped, but that when you transfer certain monies out, that then you have to replace it with something else from somewhere if you're going to continue, uh, you know, uh, investing in the system. And that can come from either cost savings or, or it has to come from somewhere is the point. And I think that, you know, in the future as, as we make decisions about, you know, fund transfers and that sort of thing, the, these sorts of longer range impacts um, need to be considered and factored in since we could hit down economies like this one. You know, it's a cyclical thing and it can happen again in the future, even if we were to come out of this one. Good point. I just want to make one last comment, which is about the chart that we saw with how well we did this last year in terms of conservation. And I do think a lot of credit goes out to the people of Glendale because I know for a fact that people are taking conservation very seriously. They're investing in water-saving devices. 
Um, but I do think we have to temper that enthusiasm a little bit and remember that we had an extremely wet year. And some of those, that, that lower peak is, is definitely due to having a wet year and having less demand on the systems. And hopefully as we go into more dry years, which we may not this year, we may not next year, but we'll certainly come back, um, we may see a little bit less of a, uh, of the, you know, we may see a little bit more of a spike again. Um, so, you know, this is going to be something that we have to look at in the long term and we can't really look at any one year. But it's certainly true that I think the conservation is becoming a way of life for people, for a lot of people in Glendale. People are, are taking it much more seriously and with the new tiered system where the homes that use the most water will be penalized and the homes that use the least water will be rewarded, I think that we will see even more of that sort of voluntary conservation. Okay, are there any last comments before we adjourn? I would like to make an announcement to the public. First, thank you all for being patient, for staying here. Those who spoke, thank you for staying through the long meeting. Those who are here for the council meeting, thank you for your patience. Um, we are going to take a 20-minute recess, um, both for the mind and the body of the council members. Um, Mr. Mr. Starbird? So are we anticipating we will come back for another discussion answering some questions before you give authority for the 218 notice? I'm okay with the 218 notice now. Is, is that a joint council? Is it just a council? Well, it could be a joint, but it would normally be a, a council public hearing, I think, for the, you mean for the for a Mr. follow-up meeting? Can you clarify the process? Right. The Prop 218 notice would be, I think the request is you want to give direction for council, for the staff to do that, and then the, the public hearing is before the city council. That's right. Uh, but you could, the, you could do, do the public hearing as a that. joint meeting. There's nothing that says you can't. I'm okay with the giving, giving the notice now. It just gives more time for people to come in and weigh in. Mr. Manukin? Okay. Mr. Contero? Well, I want more information, and like I say, I, uh, I would support, possibly support a 2% in the next three years. So I'm throwing that out. I mean, we don't know what would 2%, 2 rate increase uh, over three years, what would that bring? That's not part of what we were shown tonight. There was no information uh, other than those three options. Why don't we ask staff, first of all, to bring that model back when you come back next time? Mr. Nigerian, in terms and of... And one more thing. You know, the focus when we talked about cost-cutting, it's cost-cutting for me, not the guys and women that are climbing poles and, you know, not the rank and file, so to speak. I'm have yet to receive information concerning managers, technical staff, consultants, etc. That's what I'm talking about, not the people that are out uh, climbing poles. So the sooner you get that information to me, the happier I'll be. Mr. Seiger, do you have something to add? Yes. Uh, we could move ahead with the 218 notice and still come back with all the, uh, the requests for the information uh, at least get the 218 notice started, and then if a change needs to be made, it can certainly be made. We uh, should note you can do something less than what you've noticed in the right. 218. You can't do something more. Right. Mr. Nigerian, you're sort of the tiebreaker. No, I'm not interested. I'm, I'm quite firm in my belief about uh, packaging this with uh, opportunities for the public to save water, and I'm not interested in raising any rates until they are given that opportunity concurrently with a rate increase. So, then it fails. Okay, and then... Well, I, I think then at that point, staff can bring back the, the information that you've requested at a subsequent meeting and then we can have the further discussion because oh. obviously... In terms of setting a rate, though, I mean, is you, that what happens if there's a tie vote? Well, and it's you, not like you, an up you, and down. You, a tie vote doesn't implement a rate increase. It takes a majority. But as it relates to the issues that Mr. Najarian has raised, uh, if I heard you correctly... Uh, Isn't that loud he, enough? He wouldn't, no, I mean, if I understood you correctly, um, it, he, he would only consider a rate increase if, if they were along with the discussion of the artificial turf and other conservation measures. You could still give a 218 notice, and, and at that time, uh, if you have the support direct staff to bring back those matters that you want to discuss at the same time. Let me ask Mr. Vinajarian for clarification. Are you asking for a reconsideration, or are you saying that unless we vote your way, you're not going to vote for this. Because there's a very big difference. Let me be clear. I'm not sure I like being... Well, I need to understand what you're asking like us uh, to do. I will not support any increase in the rates on our customers unless they are given an opportunity to realize significant savings 
on their water usage through the use of non-living material in their front lawns. That's just me. Madam Mayor. Mr. Mr. Quintero wants a smaller increase. Right, well, at that Mr. point, I seem Mr. to be Mr. Manukian doesn't want, <laughs> you know, wants a much smaller increase. Well, this is my position. They're concerned about the effects on the customers, and I am also. And I want to give them an opportunity. Madam Mayor, to you now have two that have absolutely said they're not going to vote on any of this. You have you and I that agree the recommendation. You're going, to, you're going to consider the recommended? I believe. Oh, no. And I think, Mr. Jarrett, if we don't do the artificial, he's out. Right. That means the mayor and I, for the, that, and the swing guy over there who Excellent. wants something I was about like to characterize myself as the moderate and swing vote on, oh, this, you're a liberal. Uh, <laughs> on this issue. I recommend for GWP to, to investigate that 2%. I'd recommend, three years. I'd recommend we come back to you at another meeting and address that as well as other issues you've raised here this evening and then find out what your direction is going to be. Will the next meeting be another joint meeting? Uh, it can be. It's up to you. <laughs> Not this long next time, please. Well, we won't, have, we won't go through all of this background. I'd, I'd anticipate a shorter meeting, but uh, frankly, I think the commissioners have given us good input uh, in their views, and but it's entirely up to you. When we hey, give hey. input, is it going back then to the commission? for them to give us a recommendation? Well, I, no. I would anticipate coming back to you, whether you want to have the commission here or not is your decision. We'd come back and provide the information Mr. Mr. Quintero has asked for, so you can see the implications of that, plus try to address the other major issues and questions you've raised here this evening. I just like to, hate to leave the commission out of doing what they're supposed to be doing, but no, no, whatever. The, it's fine for the commission to be here, but I think what Mr. Weaver was saying, he doesn't want them to have to have a separate meeting first to hear this material. I wouldn't anticipate doing that. If you want us so, to bring it back to you directly, we'd do that. Given the difficulty of scheduling, let's try to schedule that meeting now, even though I know you may not know exactly how long it will take you to gather this information. Let's at least go ahead and schedule, um, you know, start scheduling this so that we don't run into a situation where we can't get a meeting together in a certain month. Okay, let's pick a date. Well, and I can tell by the look on their faces that they've had a wonderful afternoon. <laughs> we'd probably like to come back for more. I'm sure. We all have. Could we meet in my uh, zero scape, landscape to <laughs> backyard? No I, I'd, I'd suggest just looking at your agendas October 18. What time? Yeah, I don't want to do the scheduling at this moment, but let's do it through emails. Oh. We've got the public waiting. Let's what, what time of day? No, no, no. Let's not schedule right now. We've got the public okay. waiting for a council meeting. Right. We'll send emails around like we normally do, and everyone can check their schedules. So um, we will be meeting in 20 minutes, so it'll be 7.20 for city council meeting. Is there a move? Yes, we will. Second. Okay, thank you. Did both the commission.